the meeting's live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Williamsport City Council meeting. It's Thursday, June 25th, 6.30 p.m. We're meeting remotely again. Um, first on our agenda tonight is approval of City Council minutes dated 6-11-20. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Are there any corrections or comments from council? Hearing none, Mrs. Frank on the motion, please. Ms. Peter. Yes. Mr. Pelizzi. Yes. Mrs. Katz. Yes. Mr. Banks. Yes. Mr. Allison. Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you, Mrs. Frank. Um, item two, limited courtesy of the floor. We've had no requests tonight. Um, I want to announce right now there's going to be an executive session after our regular meeting for uh, to discuss legal matters regarding negotiations. Um, we'll move to item three, a resolution to approve a COVID-19 business uh, program, loan assistance program. Uh, Mrs. Frank, would you read that in short form, please? Resolution to approve a COVID-19 business assistance Okay, uh, thank you, Mrs. Frank. Um, is there a motion from the council tonight? So no. moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. Um, welcome, Mrs. Young. Good evening. Um, the city currently has revolving loan funds available for a shop studying loan program. And these funds originated from a DCD grant in the amount of $50,000. And this was in 1996. And the purpose of the funds was to make loans out to businesses and then get the repayments back um, to reloan to um, new businesses. And along the way, we also had some competitive enterprise zone grants that um, passed through the city. So the city acted as a pass through for the grants, but they were pretty large sums. And um, those loan repayments came back to us. So now the fund has a balance of approximately $750,000. There were several loans done in the late 90s, early 2000s, but the fund has really been dormant for quite a while. And all those loans are, as I said, all those loans are paid off now. So there's a significant amount of money in the fund. Um, and we are proposing to use the funds to develop a program to address the impact of COVID-19 um, on businesses located in the city. The terms of the loan program would include eligible businesses that have 100 employees or fewer and that are located in the city of Williamsport. Uh, loans will be offered at a minimum loan amount of $5,000 and a maximum loan amount of $25,000. The program requires that one full-time job be created or retained for every $10,000 of assistance and that one part-time job be created or retained for every $5,000 of assistance. And the loan term would be offered for a 10 year term with loan payments deferred for the first two years. Then loans would be offered at a 0% interest rate for the first five years. And then at year six, they would start at 0.5% and then increasing by 0.25% uh, each year through year 10. Um, eligible use of the funds would include supporting existing businesses reopening or existing businesses expanding related to COVID-19 um, and to create and retain jobs. Uh, this would include providing working capital assistance to avoid job loss caused by business closures related to social distancing. Also to reimburse costs, including fixed debts, payroll, accounts payable, and other documented costs occurring after March 1, 2020, if the business was required to cease operations. Um, also businesses to stabilize and expand enterprises that provide medical, food delivery, cleaning, other services to support home health and quarantine, and to assist with working capital needs. Uh, 
Again, purchase of inventory, payroll, utilities, supplies, and other expenses for operations as they existed pre-COVID-19. If the funds are requested for payroll, the hourly rate per employee would not exceed $26.44 per hour. This amount was calculated using the 2020 area median income of $64,800. And if you break that down to an hourly rate based on a 40 hour work week, um, it's $26.44. And we wanted to cap the amount that we were paying for salaries so we weren't paying exorbitant salaries. Uh, the process, uh, the city will have an open application time period that will expire on August 7th, 2020. So we'd open up applications as soon as all the approvals are, are uh, that we have all the approvals and, and council actually is the last approval that we need. Um, after this deadline of August 7th, applications will be reviewed and scored by a committee that includes the mayor, the community development director, the finance director, and a member of city council. And the applications that score the highest will be considered for processing in the first round of funding and will be presented to the city's loan review committee and to the redevelopment authority. The redevelopment authority will have final approval on the loan applications. And we decided to do rounds of funding so that we could streamline the process um, because there are so many committees that will be reviewing the application. Um, it's tough to get everyone together. So we're gonna, we're gonna do the funding in rounds. And once round one is complete, We'll begin the process for the next round. Also, just to uh, make clear, the city cannot make direct loans to commercial entities, so we have to use the redevelopment authority as the vehicle to make the loan transactions. Applicants will receive 50% of the funds at the time of the loan approval, and they'll be required to submit a report that includes documentation to support the expenditure of funds before the remaining funds are released. Marketing efforts will include ads in the Sun Gazette, posting on the city website, and working with the Chamber and the Williamsport Business Association to try to get the word out. The program will be reevaluated in 18 months from the date of city council approval. So we have a date of December 31, 2021. This will allow us to determine whether a business loan program that addresses the hardships related to COVID-19 is still necessary. Continuation of the program is contingent upon city council approval. Because the revolving loan funds originated from a DCD enterprise zone grant, the city is required to receive approval from DCD on any proposed change use of funds and DCD has approved this program. The loan program was re reviewed by ERC and there was some discussion about whether businesses needed to be physically located in the city I did send out a draft resolution yesterday to council that stated assistance would be for businesses operating in the city. So that's a little bit of a difference. But then I also added in the section about job creation and retention that the jobs that need to be created or retained have to remain in the city for two years. I thought maybe that would be a way to, to um, address that. Also, the Redevelopment Authority reviewed the loan program yesterday and voted 4-0 to increase the minimum loan amount from $5,000 to $10,000 and the maximum loan amount from $25,000 to $50,000. And they also added language in the program man manual to make it clear that the applicant would only need to pay the $500 application fee if the loan were approved and that that fee could be deducted from the loan proceeds. Um, again, this was reviewed by ERC. Thank you, Mrs. Young. Um, members of ERC, um, could we hear from you? Who would like to go first? I'll take it. Okay, um, it was reviewed by ERC um, and passed forward to council with a positive recommendation. Um, I know we had a couple of uh, discussion items, Adam, and if you'd like to jump in at any point, um, you know, one thing we were really concerned about was, uh, you know, if the majority of the business was located in, in the city or if we were, um, or if it's an outside business operating in the city. So that's what um, Ms. Young just covered there. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing that had been brought up by Mr. Yoder, and I'm sure you can go into more detail about this, was the fee um, that that was, was to be, uh, you know, put forward for application. You know, uh, Ms. Young, you said something about um, putting that on the back end of the loan, like rolling it into the, just subtracting it from the loan total. Right. Is that, that's a possibility? Right, right. That would be a way. 
I, I kicked they, around the idea that they can pay the five hundred dollars up front. They could it could come from the loan proceeds. I kicked around the idea of it being like a percentage of the loan. You know, like three percent. That way, you could it'd be graduated up and down. Because if you're getting a ten thousand dollar loan, you know, five thousand dollars or five hundred dollars is a is a decent chunk of that loan. So, Mr. Joe, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no. There was some discussion about the um, the um, the the amount and the um, purpose of the initial fees for both the application and for the review. If I'm, ter if I'm my terminology is off, Miss Young, my apologies uh, from the Redevelopment Authority. Um, and, and the discussion kind of centered around, you know, is there a way to put that in the back end of the loan included in the interest rate? So that way we can kind of do the best of both worlds. We can cover our costs. Um, but we can also get a little bit more relief um, for business. Um, and you know, the, the example that I used last Friday was, you know, in talking to a couple of small business owners um, that had got some money from the Chambers program, um, you know, they got $500 and they were ecstatic because $500 really went a long way to help them with marketing um, some revamping for their online presence um, and was extremely valuable in kind of helping them respond to um, the, the economic impact that we've um, been under um, from this. So I, I, uh, I thought it was a, an interesting point and a good idea. Um, is that something that we are able to do or, or could do, Ms. Young? Um, so what would the... You're saying just at the end of the have it become due at the yeah, end. Yeah, essentially, essentially, just take the the fees and bury them into whatever the interest would be. So they would pay it through their their um their annual payments and, and include the cost in the interest. So let's say that the rate is two percent, maybe it's two point one percent. Um, I Joe Pavlak, would you like to chime in on this and see what you think about that? I. It sounds reasonable to me that it could work, but. Um, I'm not sure that it would be possible because all the interest that's earned on the loans would need to be revolved back into the program itself, not for the admin cost. Um, oh, I'm not true. sure yeah. that it would be, a, 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 I'm not sure we'd be able to do it. I think we'd have to go back to DCED to get their approval to um, remove those through the admin or through mm -hmm. the uh, interest rate. Gotcha. What would that what would that timeline to go back to them look like if that's something that we would be interested in seeing? Uh, they've been really quick with the turnaround. Um, right. I guess it just depends. I don't, you know. Uh, right. Last for the to get approval for the program, they were they were pretty quick within the week. Okay. Um, okay. <clears throat> um, I mean, we're looking at the five hundred dollars as just a way to cover our cost. It won't even really touch staff costs, but um, you know, it's something to, because we, we are, we always have to build to programs, uh, you know, we're not paid for by the general fund. So we're always, we always are billing to grants and different programs for our staff costs. And yeah, yeah, no, no, under, understood. I, I get it. And the, the initial conversation last Friday was, you know, a $5,000 loan, it doesn't seem like a lot of money, but to a small business, it is a lot of money depending on the size. And so, $500 is a big percentage of that loan. So, um, you know, that's obviously changed now. So you had mentioned this young, the redevelopment authority had um, adjusted the, the range 10,000 to 50,000. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. What was the rationale for that? If you, if you could shed some light on that, I'm kind of curious. Um, yeah, I wrote that out in a memo and let me just, uh, they felt that um, the $5,000 amount was available from other sources and that a higher minimum loan amount um, wouldn't really allow, uh, it, it would just be something extra for them to, to have. They, they felt that they could get the $5,000 from other sources and if they didn't need the full 10,000, they could pay it back. Um, within the 10 year deferment period or the two year deferment period, but we really felt that, um, you know, we don't want this money to get stockpiled. It's, it's supposed to be used because there's a need. So. Yeah, yeah no, no, understood. Um, and then as far as the maximum loan amount of 50,000, they just thought that would have a greater impact for the businesses. Okay. Yeah, understood. Um, if I recall from the application, um, 
a part of that is um, highlighting or demonstrating if they have received funding from other sources. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we could still screen that any application process, even with a, a lower um, amount if we needed to. Yeah, I mean, that would be one of the criteria that we'd look at, you know, what okay. other sources are, you know, you don't want to have a, du you know, complete duplication. Yeah, no, understood. Um, I'm not sure what the better answer is, having a, a wider range where you can hit more businesses or shortening it so that it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a valuable and legitimate debate. So understood. Um, I have a couple other things, but I'll let other members of council chime in. So I'm not um, soaking up all the oxygen here. Um, Councilwoman Katz. Stephanie, you said that when this program was in effect in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s that um, all the money has been paid back. Uh, did it take quite a while for some of it to come back to us? Because I remember there were some shortages back then and it took a while. Uh, there were some defaults, but um, as far as the, the active loans that were being repaid, um, I mean, I think it's some of them were maybe 20 year, you know, 20 year repayment cycles. Okay. The other question I have is, um, it, I, if, I don't know if I missed it or not, but is there a definition of what they consider full time and part time? How many hours? Uh, because some businesses will have seasonal part time. Yeah. Um, I mean, full time, I think, would be 35 to 40 hours. And then anything under that is would be part time. But I don't I don't know. That's not something I, I even thought about, to be honest. Well, because of the, um, the virus and so many businesses being closed, uh, you are going to have some small businesses that will have uh, what are considered seasonal part timers. Right. And, uh, you know, if there's a, a definition of what the part time hours would be if that's, you know, clarified or um, most part time would be 20 hours a week. Um, but if you have seasonal, then more or less those seasonal part timers would be working 40 hours a week. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. It's not something I even thought about. But we can try to clarify that. Okay. But, but in that situation, Miss Katz, wouldn't uh, that part-time person be 40 hours a week, but it would be based on, you know, working a full year, would they be that down to that 20 hours? So um, I think with our language, we're trying to, or making sure it's a Williamsport business, those job, that job creation um, is looking to remain in a two-year period. So um, I, I think I'm muddying the waters, but uh, I would think that that seasonal part time that works 40 hours in the season is going to be for a full year equivalent and it'd still be a part time person. See, I have that with my business. I have seasonal part timers that come into, a, into play, you know, for Christmas, Easter, Mother's Day, those type of holidays. And I know there are other businesses that have uh, the same qualifications. They don't need a, a full time person every day. So I just wanted to, you know, if, to clarify it, if that's if, if that would be a problem for somebody that would apply for this. I know it's off the wall and it's a different, you know, type of uh, question, but I know what I deal with. Yeah, because we didn't consider seasonal workers. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something we would we'd have to address, I guess. I believe there's some flexibility to allow us to evaluate each situation independently. Mm -hmm. So we could we could do that in that case. If it okay. It, it may never come up, but just in case. Yep. That's good to know. I, I saw that um, ERC Chair Councilwoman Mealy joined. I don't know if she has any um, comments before um, bringing up a couple other things that came up um, between Friday and today. I'll defer to her quick.
I think she fell off. Um, a, a couple other things that came up in between Friday's meeting and, and tonight. Um, members of council that are here, I, I had shot everybody an email with a, a document last night. Um, in the in the original memo that uh, Treasurer Grimes and I had sent to the administration, um, we discussed the idea of a um, almost like an impact study. And, and I know the administration had done um, a lot of work with the chamber, which is very, very valuable. Um, the Covation Center had actually uh, done a similar study and, and I had forwarded on the report in there. There were a couple of interesting recommendations that I thought were um, legitimate and, and worthy of consideration as a part of this. Um, obviously these weren't discussed on Friday, um, specifically probably more of a, a little, including an educational component to this. Um, if you look at the study that I had forwarded over, um, financial assistance is very much a need for city businesses, but um, there's a lot of um, questions and, and a big need it appears from that study for additional coaching um, and help in um, preparedness and making sure that their business is prepared for not only um, future potential crises, but I think just you know a potential reshaping of, of our economy. Um, Miss Young, our our business it wasn't specifically clear to me. I could be missing it if businesses could use this money for educational purposes, whether it's um, you know operations training that kind of stuff. Could they use this money for educational purposes? Uh, that really wasn't the intent of the program. It was it was to deal with losses and to mm -hmm. recover from COVID and to be able to restart the business. Um, it was really pretty specific to the, the COVID impacts that the businesses are feeling or will feel in the future because they had to shut down or their operations ceased. Uh, we really were limiting it to that and we don't know where we're going to be in six months from now, um, too. So, you know, we want to be a little bit cautious moving forward with how we allocate the funds and, and you know, how we're helping out the businesses. So um, I would say based on, on the manual and, and the intent of the program, it's probably not something that, that would be considered um, right now. Okay. And I think DCD also the intent from DCD was to use it, you know, more along the lines of the COVID recovery. Um, I can't speak for DCD, obviously, but the little, the, when I was, you know, speaking back and forth with them, you know, they're pretty lenient, but I don't know how far they're willing to go along those lines with, with this money. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate the feedback from DCD. Um, it, it makes sense. And, you know, when you talk about um, aiding in recovery, you, you could you could make an argument one way or another for an educational component to the loan. Um, if if we are gonna, if if I, I just I, I guess I would suggest if we are gonna ask um, to go back to DCED between the fees and anything else, I, I guess I would ask that we ask them about that because um, I do think it would be something that would be very valuable. Um, and it's it, it's simply just adding another item that they could use it for. Um, as well. Um, and yours, you, you mean councilman specifically for educational and training purposes? If I were to ask, if we were to ask? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and Mayor Slaughter, I, it just occurred to me, I don't think you were on my email from last night. I can forward that, that over to you. So you have that data um, and can um, see the recommendation um, and, and talk, it talks a little bit more specifically about education, what kind of education, that kind of stuff. I'd be happy to send that over to you to support that if you're going to go back to DCED. Well, that will obviously depend on what council. Certainly. Uh, it's here tonight. So certainly. Yeah. So certainly. once once council has their decision and then you know we could we can go from there. I just want to be clear. Yeah, I, I understood. Um, the the only um, the only other thing that kind of stuck out to me from you know going through that um, was uh, w with all due respect to the work that was put into this and developing this, um, are there too many barriers for the really small businesses um, in in the city? I mean, 
you know, there, there's a there's a lot of requests for documentation, which I 100 percent understand and get. But, um, you know, with some of our small businesses in the city that may need this, um, some of them may not even have that kind of documentation, you know, P&L statements and, and that kind of stuff. I mean, you look at a small mom and pop shop, some of them may not even know what some of that stuff is. No discredit to those businesses is just they operated a little bit differently. Um, I don't know what my fellow members of council's feelings are. It's just something that came up um, to me that struck me as something that we might want to consider before um, passing this. It's just a thought. Um, so any feedback from my fellow members of council would be very much appreciated on that. On well, both of those points, actually, the educational piece and the um, potential bureaucracy associated with it. Um, on the educational piece, Adam, Randy, if you don't mind if I take the floor, is that all right? Absolutely, go ahead. Um, on the educational piece, I, I would suggest that it might be wise for us to include uh, a list of resources in the community which loan applicants might um, consider utilizing for um, to, to further inform themselves about uh, you know, generating a business plan, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't know. I honestly, in, unless I'm misunderstanding your point, I have a hard time picturing local businesses in um, in some in somewhat dire financial straits looking for a loan like this, using it for an a business educational component at this juncture. Um, only because I think people are scrambling. Um, but I do think that it would be helpful to have a list of, of resources that, that are that are available in the community um, to to you know help people put together a business plan. Um, I think information like that is always helpful and, and probably should be included with the loan package. Um, on the bureauc from the bureaucracy standpoint, Stephanie, to what extent are these items simply requirements of the original pot of funding? Well, the original pot of funding was a very complicated program. It was a maximum loan amount of 100,000. We were only funding a third of the project. There had to be a 25% cash equity match. Um, so there were a lot of really uh, more difficult hurdles than, than what's here. Um, I think in terms of documentation, it was probably because the loan amount could go up to 100,000, we were requiring a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, may, you know, these could probably be relaxed a little bit. Um, I think we were, uh, were not tied to asking for this information, but we were just working off previous manuals. Um, you know, we try to cover all the bases. And so we were um, just using other programs as a model. And that's really, you know, what we, what we ended up doing. But it is a lot more relaxed than the shop steading program requirements. Okay. Um, the only reason I'm asking is um, my business was, I, I, I think, fortunate to receive a uh, one of the paycheck protection loans, um, and uh, and so I'm familiar with the application process for that, only because um, you know because because we we happen to receive one, and I know that applicants were eligible to receive up to $10 million, I believe, not that we received anywhere near that. Um, but uh, uh, the, the application process was extremely uncomplicated. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I'm not saying that we necessarily want to mimic that, <laughs> but, um, but it is something to bear in mind. I, I don't know to what extent um, I'm, I'm assuming if we're operating, if we are loaning money out that is not actually the city's money, but is instead DCED's money, we are obliged to require certain information and certain kinds of collateral and, and, and items like that. Um, and, I, and, I, and I don't think that that is improper because I, I do think that I would like to see us continue to be able to revolve this pot of funding out. Um, but, uh, but all of that said, um, Adam, I can, I can see your point as well that, uh, that the, the application process might require a bit of a learning curve for, um, for some businesses that would be looking especially for smaller funding rounds. Um, yeah, yeah and, and again, I don't mean that to be critical or discredit the efforts of the administration. Frankly, um, I, I'm, I'm ecstatic to see this and, and I commend the administration for their efforts of putting this together. You know, it's just, a, it's just the question of, um, 
are, are we gonna are we gonna miss people or tear people off that really need this um, because of specific requirements and what have you? So it's simply just a thought, and and I appreciate the dialogue from everybody. Mm -hmm. um, the, yeah, the other the other thing I would say is <laughs> not that we want to necessarily emulate the federal government on this front, uh, but we do have the option of trying to move forward because I think the sooner that we get this program yeah. in action, the better for our local businesses. Um, we, I think we could enact it and then, and then return to some of the terms, depending on the level of interest we had, the amount of feedback we got from businesses as to whether or not um, this was an easy process to follow. Um, I, I would not recommend that we entirely revise the loan terms um, eight weeks into the loan period. Um, <laughs> just, just what just happened to me. Um, but, but I don't think that we're, um, that we're necessarily absolutely tied. If we, if we find, as we've, as we've done with other programs that we've offered, if we find that, um, that we have some, some items in here that are, that are hurdles to the businesses that we need to benefit most, I would assume, Stephanie, that we could always return um, to DCED and ask them if we could relax some of the standards at that point, too. Well, and, and DCED really hasn't reviewed the underwriting. I mean, what they reviewed were the terms of the loan, um, you know, as, as I read in the, you know, my first uh, page of my memo, um, they reviewed that the businesses will be 100 or fewer employees, the minimum and maximum loan amounts, the job creation and retention uh, amounts for assistance, and then the terms of the, the loan with the two-year deferment and then the interest rate. Um, those are basically what they, what they looked at. And so they don't get into the underwriting and how are you securing the loan and any of that. Um, I think they realize that this is um, a specific program to a unique need that we haven't seen before. Um, so, so I think they, they've been pretty flexible. Um, you know, and, and then that brings up security too. I mean, usually for our loans, we want some kind of security or collateral. You know, we want to file a mortgage or a UCC statement or something, and, yeah. and we're willing to relax those terms as well. I mean, it will be something that we'll consider in the, in the evaluation, but, um, you know, we, we don't want to make that a hard and fast rule that if you don't have collateral or security, we're not going to be able to give the loan to you. And that's something that we, we really, you know, we're pretty, feels pretty strongly about that for most of our programs that we want to be able to secure the loan. So, and the other thing I suppose we could do is if, if a business calls and says, gee, you know, I don't have any of this stuff. I don't, you know, maybe we can work with them or give them some kind of technical assistance or, or keep, keep those guidelines loose. I don't, I don't know if that, if we want to go down that road, um, because then, you know, what good's the program manual and the requirements if you're not going to follow them. But, yeah. um, you know, I think we want to be as accommodating as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, I, yeah, I think, I think we want, I think we're looking to meet a need. Um, Stephanie, I, I would agree with you there. I, I also think that, right, that we're not necessarily looking, um, as the federal government may or may not have been, to give away the $750,000 that we have. We are looking at some point to receive it back and spend it again, you know, and, and, and put it back out into the community. Um, so I think it, it's wise for us to retain um, some requirements, but I do think that we will need to consider flexibility as we move forward with the program. I, I guess what I'm, what I'm thinking, Adam, perhaps is that we're wisest to move forward, get this off the ground and then see what sort of impediments there are. And if we need to modify it, especially yeah. if Stephanie says the, the core elements that DCED reviewed are not, um, some of those things that you think might be hurdles. Because those then, it sounds, Stephanie, as though we're more than welcome to simply change those, yes. correct? Yes. Um, so so that, that gives us a lot more flexibility than, um, than I was thinking we have with the entire package. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, and and that's, a, that's, a, that's a very fair point. I mean, if we, if we as a group between the administration and council want to um, try to revisit this after eight to 10 weeks, once that first processes through what have you that would be very good I actually it may be a good thing to just do kind of like a quarterly report anyway just so we can all understand how it's going that kind of stuff I think um, the community would really like to hear that as well 
um, a, as the program goes out over the next 18 months. So. Got it. Um, if I can ask one quick question, because I did miss the beginning of the meeting, and I apologize, Stephanie, if I'm making all of you revisit uh, something you've already discussed. The one conversation we had in economic revitalization was the question of how we're defining a business that is located in the city. Um, have, have we come with, up with a better definition of that? Well, I did send out a draft resolution to try to address that. And, and what I said in the resolution was um, operating, it would be for business operating in the city of Williamsport, but that the job retention and creation must, those jobs must be located within the city and remain there for a period of two years. So you could operate outside of the city, um, or I mean, your business could be located outside of the city, but you're operating in the in the city, but you have to be able to create jobs um, that are going to be in the city and they have to be there for two years. So you don't get somebody just coming in, operating, um, you know, and then leaving in six months where, where the jobs aren't really in the city, they've moved elsewhere. So that was, I felt a way to address it. So they don't have to be physically located in the city, they operate, do business there, but any jobs that they create have to be in the city. Okay, understood. I don't uh, know if that works or not, but. I think I think that makes sense, Stephanie, and, and I apologize. I, um, somehow a lot of your emails are not arriving to the <laughs> right inbox for me, so I think I must have- Yeah, I sent that out yesterday toward the end of the day. Okay, um, but- uh, yeah, I think I think that certainly at least helps to somewhat clarify exactly what we're what we're after. Um, how does every how does everyone else, Dave and uh, Dave and Adam, do you feel like that addresses some of the concerns we were talking about at ERC? Um, from my point of view, yes. You know, and, and one thing I did want to uh, cover on this, Ms. Young, was um, the the timetable for the, all of this um, to get applications in by just for anyone interested in the program. Oh, just the August 7th deadline? Okay. Yeah, just to reemphasize that, you know, there was a turnaround, what, three week turnaround on that? I can't quite remember. Well, uh, as soon as it's approved by council, we can get it out there, start advertising. So that would be next week, you know, June 29, and then an August 7th submission deadline. So that would give, you know, just over a month for people to get the applications in. And then they would be re reviewed by the various committees and hopefully, I, and it should be a, a workable timetable, they'd get to the redevelopment authority by the last Wednesday of the month, the fourth Wednesday of the month, which I think is August 26th. So applications would come in on the 7th. It would be a quick turnaround, but um, I think we could try to make that happen. The reason I bring up the timetable is, you know, I don't have any major qualms with it as it is now. We know we're going to potentially have to revise this later, um, but getting it out to the public might be the expedience might be the most important part of this. Mm -hmm. Randy, uh, Vince had his hand up for a while. I was going to call on him. Thank you, Bonnie. I appreciate that. Um, so I had a question and, you know, it's been brought up about the terms being lax, but I, I noticed a portion of one of the requirements for this program was that the businesses had to provide a corporation or business appraisal. Um, you know, business appraisals, depending on how in depth the business is, what service it provides, what kind of inventory they have, if it's depreciable assets or inventories, whatever that may be those appraisals can very easily start at $500 and go up into the thousands. What kind of leniency is there going to be given if a company that has been affected by COVID cannot afford one of these business appraisals to be eligible for this plan? Um, I probably, I don't, as I say, when we did the manual, we were taking various parts of other manuals so that I don't think that that would even be necessary to be in there. Um, is, is that in the section related to if we're going to provide security or if they're gonna provide security for the loan? 
I, I don't have the document in front of me. I apologize. You have to forgive me. I, I lost my. Um, the only reason I say that, if it is in that section, that's one that we're we're asking for, but we're not requiring. So it might not be um, something that affects every every one or or thing. Okay. Right. right. If there was an appraisal available and we were looking at collateral you know, we'd want to know the value of that. So it would, I don't think they'd have to run out and go get an appraisal, but it would be something to document the value of a property. Okay. I appreciate that. I was just looking to get some clarity for that. Uh, I've had people ask me about these exact same kind of programs. And the reason I brought this up was because that specifically was brought up to me. So thank you. Chief Hagan, would you mind if I make a suggestion? No, go ahead. Very quickly, with regard to uh, bureaucracy, I just wanted to offer an idea. In policing, as you know, we deal with a lot of policies and procedures, and uh, you can't policy, you can't write a policy for every situation. And so at the end of some of our policies, you'll find a comma and you'll find the words unless otherwise authorized by the chief of police. And your discussion made me think of this in terms of the idea, instead of having to revisit this over and over um, and uh, uh, with respect to efficiency, possibly on the front end of this, just, uh, it, just creating a waiver process that would require if someone didn't meet the, if a business didn't meet the qualifications on the front end that they could file a waiver request and that it might it might require a unanimous uh, vote on the part of council to process the waiver or something like that but then you wouldn't have to be changing the, the standards all the time you could keep the standards that you want up front and then a waiver process could allow you to evaluate if you don't meet all those qualifications case by case Thank you, Chief. Mrs. Cat. I agree with the Chief. You know, you're not going to be able to cover every aspect of this for every because there are so many businesses that are so unique in their own beings that you know you're you're just not going to be able to uh, accomplish that. The one thing I do want to uh, address is is what Adam said about education. With a lot of your maybe so older businesses. Uh, what might be important to them at this point to try and catch up with everything would be some, the education process as far as uh, learning the new techniques with charge card machines, uh, learning techniques with uh, their website, maybe getting uh, the web designs done. And if that could be you know, incorporated into um, making their businesses more viable for the future, uh, you know, uh, to me, it's important, especially with what's going on and how to run your businesses anymore. Things are changing very quickly. Uh, it's not as it used to be years ago where it was it same old, same old. Your, your charge card systems are, are getting uh, more complicated at times. Um, your phone systems are getting sometimes more complicated. So, you know, something like that. We have Covington, is that how you say it? Um, that's in the city. Uh, they do a wonderful job as far as teaching. So that, you know, this might be important to some of our, our older businesses and even our new businesses, if that can be uh, utilized with this. Um, I, I agree with that concept. Um, I think uh, it, it, this is really a, as simple as we'd all like it, I guess, because it's a pool of money that isn't really our own. Uh, we're kind of trustees for it um, and we have to get prior approval it really wasn't uh, intended to address remediation or, or things like that although um, it's a valid point that uh, it would be valuable for any business to be able to uh, upgrade their level of technology or understanding of how to use it so I suppose that would be um, to see if, if there is that kind of latitude with DCED since we're 
the administration is going to go back and talk to them um, to see if there's any latitude to do that with this particular pool of, mo of money, given the unusual circumstances uh, that we're under right now. I guess um, uh, when I initially saw the timing of this, um, I thought um, it, it might be coming along at just the right time because the initial federal money um, has kind of worked its way through. Uh, the chamber stepped in and has addressed uh, probably immediate concerns of, of people. Uh, and now we have the ability to uh, address different levels of needs going forward for uh, the, the next few months, maybe towards the end of the year uh, or longer. So um, the, the, the different needs and desires for that money may change as we go along, but um, it's, it's going to be probably on an individual basis because I, I don't have any idea um, right now what the scope is of, of those who are going to, to need this ongoing. I suspect um, because things seem to be just step-by-step step opening back up, there is gonna be a, a definite need there. And we wanna be sure we can hit that. And that, that's what I'm hearing from everyone tonight. Um, it's a great discussion, um, but obviously we're gonna to have to, to revise as we go along. So uh, I hope someone's keeping notes tonight because there's a lot of, a lot of great ideas and a lot of great thoughts and uh, we don't want to lose them um, but as we're going forward through this uh, to, to bring different things to bear at different times. Um, uh, Mrs. Young, I wanted to ask you about something I had the opportunity to talk to you. You talked about yesterday when I happened to run into you. Um, now, the difference between the rede redevelopment authorities um, recommendations and in the cities uh, is that is is one just a recommendation or which one holds weight? Well, that was that was one of my questions because when we met with the redevelopment authority yesterday, um, it was as though they were recommendations, um, and I sort of said, well, I think council will, will have the final say about that, but I don't know that the redevelopment authority is a recommending body. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't sure, and maybe Austin can address this. Um, you know, they did take a vote. They did, uh, it was unanimous for O. So I don't know what the implications of that are in terms of moving forward. Um, but as, in terms of the discussion at the meeting, it was very much, we would like to recommend um, that, that these minimum and maximum amounts are changed. Okay. Perhaps, um, uh, Mr. White, if you get an opportunity to, to research that a little bit, or if, if you may know the answer to that already. And I can't think of a circumstance where this has happened before. Right. Uh, you know, usually it, it, there aren't changes. So it was a little bit of a different situation. Okay. Well, we definitely, I, I, that's one another thing we can clear up as we go along, uh, I suppose. Um, so, uh, well, we have a motion on the floor and we have a resolution and it sounds like we have a consensus that we wanna move on this tonight, obviously. Um, and we have a consensus that um, there are a lot of things we wanna look at to see how flexible we can be with this pool of money. So some of these things aren't gonna be resolved till later, but we can pass this 
tonight as, as has been suggested and then uh, revisit and revise if we have to. Do you want to change the language in the resolution as I proposed? Um, would you? Yes, I can, I can read the change. Yeah. So it's the second whereas, whereas the city has determined that the shop steading loan funds are needed at this time to assist businesses operating in the city of Williamsport that have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And then it's the... Uh, seventh whereas down where it says whereas the jobs must be located in the city of Williamsport and remain for a period of two years. Mm -hmm. um, Could we ask Austin if he feels that that will cover the uh, sort of our attempt to make certain that this money benefits the money that this this financial pool, I think, remains in the city. Austin, are you out there? Not so much. No, I don't think he's out there. <laughs> we, we, it looks like he lost. It looks like he lost connection. Yeah, okay. I, I believe so because he tried to. Oh, somebody had a bit of an issue with that earlier. I can understand. Um, I uh, just one thing here as well. Um, without knowing if the redevelopment authority has amending power or suggesting power here, do we need to change the resolution, the amounts on the resolution, the minimum and maximum amounts of the loans? I don't think you need to to change them if you feel that the original amounts are acceptable. I. I I mean, again, it would be up to Austin, but I think if you decide that you want to keep the original amounts, um, it would be a matter of going back to the redevelopment authority and making sure that um, there's documentation that they have um, been okay with that. I think, but. It looks like uh, Mr. White is back. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. I can. I was I was having technical difficulties, and I was speaking probably four or five times, and nobody could hear me, so I had to drop out. Ah. <laughs> well, you can back, Austin. What did you want to tell us? Yes. Um, well, I've sort of lost the technical difficulties took took over my train of thought. So if, <laughs> if Ms. Young could re repeat the amendment that she proposed to the resolution, I can opine whether or not that's sufficient. Um, okay, it's uh, the second whereas, whereas the city has determined that the shop steading loan funds are needed at this time to assist businesses operating in the city of Williamsport that may have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And then it's the seventh whereas down, whereas the jobs must be located in the city of Williamsport and remain for a period of two years. And I think the question was whether operating uh, covers a benefit to this, to the city of Williamsport, I think. Uh, I, uh, I think what I'm trying, is what I'm, what, what, what many of us are concerned about largely is that we have a, a pool of seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and we would like to see the benefit of the use of that money accrue to businesses, to uh, accrue to the city's economic future. Um, Ms. Mealy, I, I think that the, the language in the, intent, in the intent of the resolution and the program itself, of course, since this is a city of, city of Williamsport related um, loan program, of course, the intent is going to be to benefit businesses that operate in the city. I think having this language in the, in the resolution is enough. And then it's just a matter of the application process and making sure that the, that the applicants understand that you know, this is a program that's intended to benefit people of some connection to the city. So, I mean, I think it's sort of something that would shake out and in, in once applications come in and, mm -hmm. and having the individuals who review those applications to ask questions on, on those types of issues. And if, if there's an, uh, a question of whether or not they actually do have a tie to the city. So I think it, it looks okay from my perspective. Sounds good. Um, all right, then Steph, if, if, uh, 
I will make a motion to amend the resolution to add the language suggested by Stephanie. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. Further discussion on the amendments to this resolution? Hearing none, Mrs. Frank on the motion to amend. Mr. Young. Yes. Mr. Polizzi. Yes. Mrs. Cat. Yes. Mr. Bank. Yes. Ms. Mealy. Yes. Mr. Alice. Yes. Motion uh, to amend passes 6-0. Thank you, Mrs. Frank. Uh, now on the resolution itself, are there any other comments or questions? Uh, and, oops, sorry. Oh, Mayor Slaughter? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt Councilwoman Mealy. I was just gonna say, that were we able to get clarification from Austin on uh, the redevelopment authority of 5,000 or 10,000 and whether or not we need to change that? Ah, yes. Good point. Thank you, Rich. Do you have an opinion on that, Mr. White? Well, I, if I, my understanding, the redevelopment authority voted to to raise the numbers, and is this this resolution has different numbers? That that's that's the issue, right? Yes, and whether they're they are are a recommending body or. You know, it, it really depends on the circumstance. Um, I, I, you know, to make, to give that opinion, I'd have to look at the, you know, all of the underlying uh, uh, law and contractual arrangements for this mm -hmm. loan. So I don't know that I could, I don't know that I could do that on the fly. Right. Um, but if certainly if there, if there's an interest in of council to um, uh, agree with their recommendation, you know, the, the path to be would to go would be to amend this resolution to align with that. Um, if, if I'm reading what I heard earlier, uh, the consensus was to go with council's limits. Uh, I believe that's what I heard five to 25. Um, could uh, suppose we passed this tonight and you gave us a different opinion, we could come back and amend it, correct? The, the, yes, that's correct. So you could pa you could pass it as, as it's presented, and then um, we could um, look at look at their recommendation and what council passed, and figure out whether or not we do need to amend it. And if we do, we could always do it uh, two weeks from tonight. Um, is everybody satisfied with that? Um, that, that makes sense to me. Um, on the other hand, I actually having missed the early part of that discussion would not necessarily object to changing the loan amounts either. So. Okay. What's the, what's the chime in on that then? What do people think about changing to the redevelopment authority limits? Mr. Banks? Well, is there any harm in just, uh, changing the maximum amount that gives us Flexibility on both sides. I think that, I, I think the 5,000 is personally, I, I think that Dave's right that it doesn't matter. Um, but that the 5,000 is unlikely to be appealing just because of the, the application fee factor and all the work for the, um, that, that's required, you know, that we're it's currently part of the loan application process. It, it'd be a lot to go through for a five thousand dollar loan. Um, so I'm not sure that leaving the leaving the minimum at five thousand is going to hurt anything one way or the other because I'm not certain that would have been a target of anyone um, applying for for a loan. Other thoughts from council on the five. Limit or ten limit. Would you care to make a motion to amend, Ms. Mealy? Sure. <laughs> Sorry, Randy. I don't. I don't mean to be sitting here like a bump on a log. I'm just kind of. Just keep waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Okay. I'll make a motion to amend the. Let me see here. 
Um, third, whereas clause in this resolution to read, whereas the program will offer a minimum loan amount of $5,000 and a maximum loan amount of $50,000. Um, and I'd be looking for a second. A second that. Um, there's a motion and a second to amend from five to 10 and 25 to 50. Uh, for, we left the five alone, so it's we'll leave five alone. Okay, it's, it's broadening the the, the the amount of the loan from five to fifty. We have a motion on the floor to amend the upper limit from twenty-five to fifty. Is there? There's a motion in a second. Is there any discussion on that? Hearing none, we'll have the uh, vote on the motion to amend. Mrs. Frank, please. Mr. Yoder. Yes. Mr. Pulis. Yes. Mrs. Cat. Yes. Mr. Bank. Yes. Ms. Mealy. Yes. Mr. Allen. Yes. Motion to amend passes 6 0. Thank you, Mrs. Frank. Um, I think that was, that was a safe one. And if we do have to amend, again, we only have to do one of them, so. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, um, is the, are we ready for the vote on the resolution itself now? I think we are, I don't hear anything else. So we'll have the vote on the original motion on the resolution, please, Mrs. Frank. Mr. Yo. Yes. Mr. Polizzi. Yes. Mrs. Cat. Yes. Mr. Bank. Yes. Ms. Mealer. Yes. Mr. Allen. Yes. And the resolution passes as amended and twice and final vote 6 0. Thank you, Mrs. Frank. Um, I want to thank the ERC committee for your good work on this uh, and all the council. A lot of good questions tonight. and. Uh, Mrs. Young and Mr. Pavlov, thank you for your uh, valuable professional input on this, and Mr. White as well. So we'll move on to um, item four, resolution for consulting agreement between the Williamsport Bureau of Police. Would you read that in short form, please, Mrs. Frank? Resolution for a consulting agreement between the Williamsport Bureau of Police and the Pennsylvania Chiefs of Police Association. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. Um, welcome, welcome tonight, Chief Hager. Thank you, uh, President Allison, Vice President Mealy, members of council. Um, resolution before you is for our standard uh, consulting agreement with Pennsylvania Chiefs of Police who provide us uh, with a range of services from um, consulting uh, on promotional testing, and, as you know, also accreditation and various other services. Uh, this consulting agreement um, is for the cost of $1,500 per day plus expenses for a maximum, can, uh, maximum of eight candidates per day for oral uh, interviews, which are necessary as part of our promotional test. This uh, was reviewed by finance and passed on to the full body with a positive recommendation. Um, I did wanna add one, uh, one issue here. They're not gonna charge us for an entire uh, second day. If we have nine candidates, this issue was discussed we do have nine people taking the written test. If all of them pass, um, we would have one more than what the contract allows. So there would be a small fee of, of uh, $300 if we do end up with more than the agreed upon eight, but they will go ahead and do it all in one day if it's nine. That saves us uh, the extra $1,200. Uh, that comes directly from uh, Mr. Gregory Bean of PA Chiefs. So that's, that was just uh, an issue with uh, uh, having one extra person. Other than that, as I explained in the committee, this is uh, 
a professional organization that helps us ensure uh, uh, that we have a, uh, a non-biased um, promotional process. Uh, this group provides us with retired chiefs and captains and former police administrators from all over the state of Pennsylvania who are associated with the organization. They come here, they have a, a, a certain uh, criteria that they follow um, that uh, where they ask the same questions at each different promotional test, corporal, sergeant, agent, and lieutenant. And, uh, and then they give us a score, which we, uh, along with the written test score, um, we calculate a final score that then is, uh, allows us to rank the people who pass the test on a civil service list and uh, then make the necessary promotions as slots come open. So this is a, a very important part of our process here to ensure that we uh, are uh, appropriately. Questions, thank you. Thank you, Chief Higgins. Um, so this was reviewed in finance. Yep. And uh, finance did forward it to the full body of council with a positive recommendation. Uh, this is our second year returning to this organization for evaluations. Um, we, we did have uh, a limited conversation, I think, um, that I initiated about the role of those familiar with an individual in the promotion process. <laughs> Um, but the, the, um, that, that is to say that it's, it's good both to have an impartial um, board that makes a decision, but it probably is, all, is or generally speaking, in um, the world of evaluations is valuable to have someone who, who may have interacted with the person in the past um, in, a, in a working capacity. Um, but the, the chief assured us, and especially given the particular situation within a police department, which is a little different from your average uh, business, that this is the um, the most professional way to eliminate any charges of bias or anything like that from the um, from the the overall picture. And uh, as I said, we forwarded it to the full body of council with positive recommendation. Thank you, Ms. Mealy. Um, anyone else on finance care to comment? Anyone on council? Um, hearing none, uh, we'll have the vote, please, Mrs. Frank. Mr. Yoder. Yes. Mr. Polizzi. Yes. Mrs. Cat. Yes. Mr. Bank. Yes. Ms. Mealy. Yes. Mr. Allen. Yes. Motion passes six zero. Thank you, Mrs. Frank. We'll move on to uh, item five. And the next items five through eight are also Chief Hagan. Um, would you read item five in short form, please, Mrs. Frank? Resolution for an agreement for tactical team placement between the Lycoming County Williamsport Police Special Response Team and the South Williams. Thank you, Mrs. Frank. Is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Um, motion and a second. Um, this and the next three are all part of uh, uh, the same subject. So Chief Hagan, would you care to jump in on that? Uh, thank you once again, members of council uh, before you our four resolutions identical in language except for the name of the agency. Uh, we are extraordinarily fortunate to, to have the, the participation of four other agencies in our county in our CERT team. Um, our CERT team is uh, our special response team. Um, those of you familiar with police operations are aware that uh, SWAT, which stands for Special Weapons and Tactics, uh, is also represented by other names like ERT, emergency response, or special response. So our version of SWAT is CERT. Um, it is in every way as capable on a smaller level as those teams in larger cities like Los Angeles and New York. Um, 
we are highly trained with, in some cases, decades of experience, certainly at the leadership level. And <clears throat> this team has literally saved human life over decades here in Lycoming County and elsewhere. Um, so they're an extraordinary team. Um, we got into a long discussion in the, in the committees about um, costs and I have, uh, I, I thought I was familiar with most of what the team did. I've become even more familiar since Tuesday uh, in anticipation of questions, but um, the capabilities of our team um, are for high risk search warrants, barricaded gunmen, hostage situations, um, quick reaction force operations, riot response, the deployment of less lethal and also sniper operations and uh, various uh, high risk situations, um, rescue operations, including uh, downed officer drills and also downed citizens. And uh, just to give you an idea, um, I looked at the last five years. In the last five years, this team has had a total of 46 call outs. Of those 46 call outs, 43 or 93% were in Lycoming County, 36 were in the city of Williamsport. So 36 of 46 in the last five years were in the city, 78%. Uh, of those uh, 46, 34 were high risk search warrant entries. Uh, the type that you do when you know you're going to go into a a drug house where you expect to have weapons and or uh, you're going into uh, a, to, to do a high risk search warrant, maybe for a homicide suspect and you expect the suspect to be armed. So these are skills that our team, which by the way, has a call out that is typically one fourth as, as uh, or, or four times faster than the state police team because they're coming from all over. Their call out time is about four hours. Generally our team for city operations is ready within an hour to two at the most, usually an hour. Um, to have that kind of capability that quick means that our patrol officers and the patrol officers and troopers from nearby cities and, and the F troop in Montoursville aren't exposed to a high level of uh, danger that they don't have the training and equipment to handle that requires a tactical response. We're able to provide that response quicker than the state can. Um, and in some cases, it, it is literally the difference between life and death. So we looked at uh, some of the issues. Um, and what I wanted to do with these agreements that are before you here is to ensure, first of all, that we have um, updated agreements with all four of the agencies that are providing us with support. Tie Dot and Valley Regional has two of its officers on our team. Uh, South, South Williamsport Police Department has one. The Sheriff's Department has one and the county detectives have one. They had two, but uh, one is no longer on the team. So um, a total of five. We have seven of our officers uh, that are on the team. So that's 12. Then uh, the command element involves the assistant chief and I as always, and then we have uh, a number of tactical medics from UPMC and Susquehanna that uh, round out our team, including the administrators. It's a total of 19 people, but the primary operators on the team, including the team commander, Lieutenant Smith, uh, account for 12 total people, five of which are um, from other agencies. So the value to the city of that uh, involvement we took a look at their base salaries. This doesn't even include the overtime that these cities and municipalities in the county are paying for their responses. I don't have all those numbers yet. I will within the next few days probably, um, but just the 26 training dates alone each year, uh, when you look at the salaries that they're contributing is $26,599. So that's a huge value. So the other reason for redoing or doing uh, these agreements and bringing them before you again was the idea that we have different funding sources for specialized training. I already said that the, their agencies are, are responsible for and are handling 
the every two week training or the 26 training dates. So if a South side officer comes and trains every two weeks with us for eight hours, their parent agency is paying the salary and benefits for that. And also if we call them out on an SRT call out, their agency is paying the overtime. However, um, for specialized training, like basic SWAT school, less lethal schools, firearms uh, schools associated with CERT training, we have different funding sources for that. For our officers, the city will pay. Sometimes the North Central Terror, Ter Terrorism Task Force will fund the training ahead of time and or also equipment. Um, sometimes the parent agency will pay or assist and sometimes uh, the district attorney will assist and has in, in many cases in the past assisted with funding uh, this specialized training, particularly when it uh, involved officers that weren't Williamsport police officers. So what we were looking at is a situation where if we get an opportunity to uh, send someone to a school and we don't have much of a heads up on it and we can't find any support from either federal, state, or local, uh, their own municipalities can't do it, and the DA can't support it in whole or even in part, then uh, what we would be able to do on a very uh, rare occasion where none of those things applied, we could use uh, our regular training budget from the police to send one of these officers attached to our CERT team to a specialized training um, Considering the fact that we're getting so much from them and their municipalities, I thought it was appropriate to at least have this as an option. It would never be the first option. And certainly uh, in, in, in schools that we have uh, time to plan for and budget for, it, it wouldn't be an option at all. But we do get some, some training opportunities come up and we don't have much notice. And when they do, it would be nice to not have to pass them up every single time simply because we don't have the time to uh, get, you know, funding elsewhere. And uh, so, and some of these, again, some of these trainings come up like once a year. And uh, so it'd be nice to, to be able to send them. I, I think I sent to council uh, an email that uh, the assistant team leader responsible for training, Agent Snyder sent me, just to give you an idea to send three SWAT operators to basic SWAT three of them from outside the city, they want to send four. One of them is from our agency and three new ones are from other agencies. The three would cost a total of $5,307. Now, since the, uh, since the meetings on Tuesday, I did talk to uh, CERT and was, uh, was advised that in the recent past, uh, the North Central Terrorism Task Force also started allowing for the reimbursement of training itself, not just fronting money up front or paying for equipment up front, but you can actually submit a request and they already have for the reimbursement of some training. So in the case of the basic SWAT course, the cost that I just advised you of, if we spent the money um, on, these, on these officers, then we could get reimbursed for it. Obviously, if... Uh, if their own agencies spend it, then they would have to submit a separate request for reimbursement from the Terrorism Task Force, which is essentially uh, Pima. They they operate under the guise of Pima. So um, we have that also that if we did, in a rare case, use our training budget money, there would be a good chance uh, for for a search school. Um, there would be a good chance that we could submit a request for reimbursement. Um, I don't know if we would get it in every case, but in the case of basic SWAT, I've already been advised that it was approved. So um, that just gives you some something to think about. Um, this team is, is, as I said, Tuesday, it's 30 years old. Um, we're extraordinarily proud of these officers. They're the only ones who are required on the department are required to maintain a, a physical fitness standard. Um, and they do so and they voluntarily do so. They keep high physical fitness standards and performance standards in their jobs. Um, they're, they're all excellent officers and we're very proud of them. So I'm open to any questions, thank you. Okay, thank you, Chief Hagan. Um, 
we I was going to go to the committees first, but did you have a, a question, Mr. Polivy, that uh, you're, you're muted? I said I did, but if you're going to committees first, I can uh, happily wait. Okay. Um, let, let's go to committee as we usually do. The, it was reviewed in um, finance and public safety. Um, so there's, and there's a lot of convergence of members there. So um, let's just, I'm just going to start with uh, Ms. Neely and um, we'll work our way through. Uh, Ms. Katz was in two meetings and um, as well as others. So. Okay. Um, yeah, and I can uh, um, work to address what what finance the, the discussion in finance, and then I'll, I'll leave to Mrs. Katz the discussion of public safety, obviously. Um, uh, and I believe, um, unless anyone strenuously objects, everything I say, our entire discussion was basically about all four items simultaneously. Uh, that is to say, just for clarity for the public. All of these these four these four contracts or under memorandums of understanding are identical, with the exception of the name of the name, named agency. Um, consequently, I, I, the discussion in finance um, treated all of them together, and then we sort of went in a row and, and, and voted on all four um, immediately afterward. Um, and uh, and so the um, we had. Finance had discussions surrounding a number of issues re related to, to sort of financial implications of these agreements. Um, so first I'll ask Chief Hagan, the, one of the items that we had requested from you on Tuesday, um, and I don't know if you've compiled the information, is a, uh, a kind of a, an annual average, if we go back over the past five years, of what we've spent on specialized training um, per officer for the CERT. we're still putting it together now um we got the operational numbers uh which i already gave in terms of the number of uh call outs and responses but we're still trying to put the financial numbers together um these were not kept in an organized way um separate from other training within the bureau and so it's going to take a little more time got it and and just to Piggyback down on what the chief said. This the secondary recommendation from finance was that if if these um, agreements are adopted as uh, recommended by the police department, that is to say, including the language that allows us to compensate um, or to not to compensate, but it, but to pay for trainings for officers from other agencies, um, that we should create a separate line item in the police budget that specifically tracks. Um, the training budget for the for the for the cert for one thing, and then the um, the the amount of that budget that's been spent on training for outside agencies versus city officers, um, because obviously <laughs> that information would have been easier for the chief to obtain had we been doing that. <laughs> but, um, uh, but so the the discussion in finance, I think, and um, and I, I was. I think the primary driver, although of course I'll, I'll be more than happy to, I'll be happy to hear from other members of finance, um, was uh, on not so much who's taking care of sort of day-to-day -day management of the CERT. The, the, as you'll notice in all of these resolutions, um, the, the CERT team is referred to as the Lycoming County Williamsport Bureau of Police um, special response team, um, meaning that at some point, you know, most of these teams um, from discussion with the chief are managed by a county force of some sort or another or by the state police. That is to say we have operating in this area, the state police team. I think you said there was one from Columbia and Montour County. Um, there's one from State College that operates out of center that operates mostly um, is managed, I think you said, by the borough, but is, is an arm of Center County. Um, and, and so part of our discussion was who's sort of whose team is this and consequently who should bear the, the, the financial element of the training. We know that each individual participant in the team bears the financial burden of, of, compens of the, the officer's compensation and pensions, et cetera, et cetera. But, but the idea of um, 
of the specialized training and whose budget that should come out of was was the particular discussion we were having and um and i think just to uh go ahead and break the suspense the, the vote the votes from finance came out two one on every item i was the uh, i was the nay vote and the other two members of finance bonnie and adam were um were yay votes for for all four items um i uh i did mentioned to the chief, um, Adam had suggested that we could consider making all of these agreements one year agreements. Um, and I would feel more comfortable with that as an arrangement um, because in part because it concerns me to see the city taking on fiscal responsibility for something which really is a countywide function um, in any capacity, especially not knowing what that fiscal commitment is on an annual basis currently. <laughs> Um, or is likely to be moving forward, um, but also because the um, uh, excuse me because you know putting putting a putting because the city is obviously entering a budget season unlike any other this year and a, and a budget next year that's going to be especially painful. So for us to be proposing to further extend that budget to cover. Um, training for officers from other municipalities when we're not certain that there's going to be a budget for the basic services that we need to cover within our city um, struck me as particularly unwise um, just in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as, as I mentioned, and I'll defer to other members of finance to address their feelings about the issue in greater depth, um, the, that those, um, while, while Mr. Yoder did suggest the one year sunset on the agreements, um, uh, that I think was was an opinion felt that I that I felt more strongly about than other members of the finance committee. Um, and I'm trying to remember, you know what? I, I'm, I'm Randy. I'll defer to Bonnie and, and public safety. I think there might have been one more point that I needed to raise about this, but but right now it escapes me. So um, so I'll I'll go back and think about that for a bit and uh, and defer to other members of finance and or the and or the chair of public safety. Uh, Miss Miss Katz. You're still muted. Boy, I can't wait till we're sitting across from one another. <laughs> um, Chief, when this was founded in 1990, was this strictly a city um, task force? Um, and then how did it get into having the other partnerships? Yes we invented this team it is ours the reason why um, we incur the cost that we do is because it's ours um, we not only manage it we invented it all of the original team members were from this agency for the first 18 or 19 years it remained that way um, this is a team that started with its own jumpsuits out of a bread truck okay and has evolved into uh, a, a very, very talented uh, unit, as I described earlier. The, uh, the, the CERT team is really an example of what many of you uh, talked about and many other uh, candidates talked about in your campaigns with regard to regionalized policing. This, is, uh, uh, this was all on us in the beginning. And then in the late 90s and early 2000s, we saw uh, the chief of He's now the chief of Old Lake Cumming. Uh, Joe Hope was a member many years ago. Chad Aldender for, from uh, Tidot and Valley Regional, one of his Jersey Shore became a member. For many years, we had, uh, we had only one or two. And then uh, we had Jim Bowers from Penn College and others. And now we're up to five. And, uh, and not just coming and expecting us to pay, but putting in time and money and paying overtime um, we've seen uh, the development of the terrorism task force after 9-11, and uh, they purchased an $80,000 vehicle that you see our CERT team using now, um, a nearly $30,000 bulletproof blanket, um, mini vests to the tune of four to $5,000 per tactical vest, all of that purchased by the federal government, annual training in the uh, tens of thousands of dollars in New Mexico the last two years provided to us hotel training, meals, everything by the federal government. 
this is a shared effort, federal, state, and local, to provide a team here. And um, yes, we we do have a footprint and we do have a, a responsibility to, to pay our officers and their overtime as part of this and then provide the training for our officers. Um, but we, as I said with the, the statistics earlier, we see the use of this team at the level of 78% of its call outs over the last five years in the city limits. And, uh, and that is a huge benefit to have at this point, five people from outside agencies uh, able to come in here to the city 78% of the time from their jurisdictions and help us at this advanced level. So I recognize it, the appearance of a change um, and, it, and it is, I mean, it would offer us a, another way. And, I, and let me just state, I, I, I did not mention the CERT donation account. That is yet another avenue of funding uh, that we would explore prior to uh, going to our general fund or our training budget for the money. It is a, it is a slight change, but I think it's a responsible one uh, because of what they're giving us. Um, it's a partnership. Uh, these these agencies are putting their people in they are risking their lives and and, and at an extraordinary level and i'm we're all again we're all very proud of them i i share your concerns uh, ms mealy and and all of your concerns about covid and i i'm willing to do whatever you want uh but my my advice on this is that we make this option available we may never use it but uh, it may prove on an occasion here or there uh, to be very useful. And especially with the terrorism task force, at least in some cases, willing to reimburse, um, that's even, even better. So thank you. Chief, with the, um, most of the concern really is the financial end of this. Um, with the DA's office and also um, the county, uh, especially the DA's office, don't they get quite a large amount of money with the, with uh, drugs and, and uh, that type of money? And don't we benefit from that? Yes, we do in many ways uh, with regard to operations. That money can't be used for our basic salaries and, and overtime for basic uh, police operations, but it can for some special operations certainly drug operations it can be used for equipment and it can be used for specialized training and over the years um it has been the the list that we're going to get together for the last five years requested by uh ms mealy is uh is going to show the different funding sources that we've used and you you will see once we get that list together how many times the district attorney has contributed be it for our officers or for officers from other jurisdictions as part of CERT. They've contributed many times and, and also in many other ways outside of CERT. So yes. I would, to me, I would assume the DA's office would have, um, I don't know how much money they would have, but you know, I know they've helped tremendously in the past and uh, this would be a perfect opportunity to even go after the DA for more um, funding for this training. Uh, to me, I would look at that aspect of it. Um, we also, from what I remember with the conversation at the committee uh, meeting, uh, we have from the Waynesport Police Bureau, we have seven members represented, right? Yes, from Lieutenant down to operator level. There's also the two of us uh, in the command structure, the Assistant Chief and I, who uh, get involved in some responses depending on what type of incident it is. Um, so really nine, but seven are members of the bargaining unit in the union between lieutenant and officer. Now, I know what uh, Ms. Mealy is talking about. The parent agencies that we've had, uh, this is the first time we're asking for money from them for training. I did some research in an attempt to have a solid answer on that. Um, our CERT leadership was under the impression that uh, some of our training or general funds may have been used for officers outside of the juris this jurisdiction in the past. I looked at one example involving Jen Bowers from Penn College, and in fact, that was not the case. 
I believe Mr. Pavlock was right. That was not done. And uh, that was his reason for wanting this in writing because he didn't believe it was done before. We looked at that case uh, where an officer from the city was sent with an officer from Bing College who was on the team. And the only one we paid for at, in that case in 2014 was the city officer. So this would be a minor change, like I said, would give us another avenue in case we had a last minute opportunity where we couldn't get funding anywhere else. But it's really just a minor change. The bulk of this agreement is to just solidify the actual working relationship between these other agencies and their officers. Um, the That one little additional sentence with the word may in it, um, again, it may never be used. It's just another option. That was all. I'll defer to other council members at this point. Thank you, Chief. Mr. Yoder. Yeah, as, as one of the two um, positive votes on the committee, I mean, everything that we really talked about has been hashed. You did reference uh, Chief Hagan last year's campaign and many of us talking about regionalization. That was something kind of discussed um, at the committee meeting. And, you know, the ask that I had of, of you and the administration in that meeting, and I would reiterate is, you know, over the next year, um, we really should work to um, have the discussion with the county about not necessarily managing this from a day to day, um, but um, maybe solidifying that regional um, financial resource. Um, I know that the city does heavily benefit from this, but um, if we are going to talk regionalization, um, and specifically since this is really a regional resource, um, we should really push forward on that. So it's my hope that over the next year um, we can do that. Uh, thanks, Mr. Yoder. Um, Mr. Polithi, you've been patiently waiting. No worries. I I wrote my questions down so I wouldn't forget them. Smart man. Thank you. Um, Chief Hagan, thank you. Um, so what I was curious about was <clears throat> from the resolutions that I read, you know, it shows the, the cost, obviously, of, of having these CERT members trained some of who are not members of the Lycoming County Williamsport Police Department, right? So at, at first it was understood that this would be a, a cost incurred by city taxpayers to pay for training for police officers that are not part of the Williamsport Police Department, correct? Um, the, the additional sentence in there um, would allow that to occur where According to Mr. Pavlock, it hasn't in the past, but it would be at the very end of a long line of attempts to find funding at the federal level, at the county level, uh, from their own municipalities, from the CERT donation account. And if that money was not available in any of those, which I, I have to believe would be a very rare circumstance, um, and we had a last minute school opportunity that we really felt it was important then we would, uh, we would have this as an option. And uh, what I just recently found out is, even if we did do this on a very rare occasion, it, it might be uh, possible to get reimbursements. Um, in the case of the basic SWAT numbers that I sent you in the email, uh, that would be approved if we paid it out uh, for reimbursement. So just to affirm what, what was just said, that if the city were to go through and pay for the any additional specialized training that the city may incur, that will be reimbursed back to the city through the, the agency that you just mentioned? Um, in the case of the basic SWAT training, I can't say it would be every course, but in that case, a request was submitted uh, after our CERT team leadership found out at the end of last year that the North Central Terrorism Task Force, which operates under the leadership of Pima, um, after they found out last year that they would uh, be open to reimbursing some training, they did a request with regard to these basic SWAT course slots, and they approved a request for reimbursement in that case. I can't say that it would happen in every case, but it was a welcome surprise to find that out on Tuesday after the committee meetings. I spoke to them at length about this and uh, they showed me 
uh, the documents that they submitted requesting a reimbursement if in fact we actually sent people and it was approved. So in this case, it would be, um, the only issue is if we don't pay for those um, officers from other jurisdictions, then their own agencies that did pay or the DA or whoever paid would have to submit a separate request to the task force and Pima. Um, we can only get reimbursed for the funds we spend. Okay, so I just wanna, I apologize. I keep feeling like I'm picking, but if we spend the money and we pay not only for our officers, but also officers of other departments, we will be in re reimbursed for the entire, or we will be in re reimbursed that money. Um, however, if we decide not to pay for outside officers, then whomever, whichever municipality borough or whomever they're employed by, they'll have to try and seek reimbursement on their own. Is that correct? Uh, that's my understanding from talking to CERT team leadership who communicated directly with the Terrorism Task Force and Pima. That was what they were told. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Ms. Mealy. Um, just to just to clarify, though, Chief, what you're saying is in this for this one particular type of specialized training, that's the case. Um, I'm assuming we go for more than basic SWAT team training on an annual basis. Yes, ma'am, and those requests are particular to uh, each school, so or piece of equipment. So each time we did that and wanted reimbursed, we would have to make a separate request. But this is an entity that might reimburse other requests as well. Um, that's, yeah. that's good to know. I mean, it, it's, it's good to know that there's funding out there and that we are seeking it. Um, and I'm happy to know that we are getting reimbursement from some of our expenditures. Um, I would nonetheless make the case that I don't feel that this is a budget year in which the city can afford to take the gamble of not being reimbursed um, for training for officers who are not city officers. But, um, but I think that it's, it's good that we found that as, as an outlet and as a potential reimbursement strategy. Um, and uh, just to, to reintroduce the concept, um, are there other members of council who would feel more comfortable if these agreements had a one-year limit? Um, or is that something that, you know, I don't, um, I, I, I'm not comfortable with the agreements as written, with the idea that we would move forward um, indefinitely potentially paying for um, specialized training in an unknown amount annually for other members or for, for um, third participants from other agencies. I think as much as I, uh, as much as I appreciate and value the, the contributions to the CERT team, um, it seems to me that as a regional effort, um, those, those sorts of common expenditures we should be looking towards some county county entity to deal with, and uh, and if the city takes it on, I fear that we will never get rid of it, <laughs> and um, and and that we will find ourselves just a little further in the hole than we have been previously. Um, if we take it on with a with a one year sunset on the agreement, um, I feel more comfortable because that gives us a year to evaluate our expenditures um, to see how they are and to begin the process that Mr. Yoder discussed of um, attempting to make this a regional entity that may, that may or may not be managed by the city because we have the knowledgeable command staff required to manage it, but that is um, a regional entity operating out of the county with the city taking the lead as the county seat um, and the city receiving granted benefit from this in the same way that I'm assuming that any county seat in any of the counties served by CERT teams does, um, but also providing benefit in the form of exceptionally highly trained officers to, um, to the outlying municipalities. Um, I don't know how other members of council feel about that, but I see Adam's got his hand up. I would agree. I'd, be, I'd be on board with a, uh, a one year and then revisit this next year. Uh, again, I, as I mentioned on Tuesday, I'm all for this program. Um, the supporting data helps. Um, and I'll look forward to the additional data the chief is putting together. Um, Austin, if you're there, um, it seems to me that, and I'll happily make the motion. Um, Liz, I assume you would second. 
Um, we could do that just simply on the resolution. I don't know if we need to do anything differently than just adding on to the end for one year as of the date of approval of city council. I would assume it might be. Sorry, Austin. Austin, if you're talking, you're muted. All right, can can you hear me? Yep. yep. Yes. Okay, so the the agreement has um, each one of them in section two under duration has that it remains in full force and effect until each until either the chiefs of police of a signatory notifies the district of attorney uh, of withdrawal. So the way these are written, they can be ended at any time, um, and that would be a council action. I mean, so if it's to me, I, I don't see a term. It's not perpetual, it's voluntary participation. So if council were at any point to determine that this agreement, that it wants to terminate this agreement, that's something that you'd be able to do. I don't know that you need to put a term limit on it. Would, um, would doing so act as a trigger? That's the only other thing, I mean, to your yeah. point, that, that makes sense. Um, yeah, what, what you could do is you could put, you could amend the resolution to, to, pr to provide that Council so shall revisit um, this agreement um, within one year from its effective date to determine whether or not it shall be renewed or something like that. So at least it's a reminder or something in the resolution that does act like a trigger if if there's a desire to have it revisited um, and to memorialize that desire in the council action, that's fine. But as far as the term of the agreement, it appears to be that it's voluntary and can be exited at any point. And I think uh, Chief Hagan wanted to say something. Just briefly, uh, for efficiency's sake, I was thinking possibly in the title, if we could just amend it and put resolution for an annual agreement. And then again, down in the paragraph um, of the city of Williamsport that the annual agreement attached here to, um, just the, the addition of the word annual before agreement seems to me like it would accomplish what you want. Do you agree? You could uh, you could make it a, a resolution for an annual agreement. Um, you could do it that way. I think if you're going to do it that way, it probably does make sense to just put in in the resolution this this uh, this agreement should be for a term for one of one year and should be re uh, reviewed by council prior to um, the, uh, the completion of that year uh, in terms of whether or not it should be renewed or something to that effect. I mean that's not the best language ever, but. Um, something saying that it's a, a term of one year would be fine. But again, I mean, that's, that's if, if that's the desire, that's fine with me. I'm just letting you know that it's, it's not necessary. It's not absolutely required. It's just, it, it's an option. Um, Mr. Back, you had your hand up for a while. So I guess my question would be, um, as it stands, I'm not um, in support of these purely in terms of, I don't want the city paying for uh, these specialized trainings for other, other police departments. Um, and Chief, could you clarify for me? I mean, these these reimbursement revenues, they're available to these other agencies, correct? Uh, they are. The difference would be, I don't know how quickly uh, they can recover. I don't know what kind of time period you need to have a request in. So uh, specifically when it applies to last minute training opportunities, which do come up from time to time, um, it, uh, it might not apply in a situation like that. Certainly where you have some, uh, knowledge, uh, several months in advance, there's time to, uh, make application for reimbursement in that type of case. But sometimes, for instance, in a situation where you, we've had $20,000 worth of training canceled because of coronavirus. And then as soon as society opened back up, all of a sudden you have all these training opportunities and everyone's jumping for them really quick and you have to react. And I don't know if I would have to do more research. I don't know if uh, the reimbursement process would apply to schools that you need to act on really quickly. Certainly I believe they would uh, with regard to cert team 
where we have some advance notice, yes. Yeah, I mean, I guess my issue is, well, one of my issues is, you know, this this really should be a, a county run. I mean, it's really, it's, you said seven counties service, so it's maybe even a larger entity. Um, now, managed by, by you, but, um, but uh, something above the, the city level, it's, you know, for us to put this money out, potentially put this money out, um, and not know that we're going to get reimbursed for it. Well, it's kind of like, why buy the cow if you're going to get the milk for free for these other communities, the other, other police forces to regionalize with us? You know, it's like, we're, if we're going to pay for their specialized training for these officers, like what incentive do they have to come alongside us in the future? Um, I, like I said before, uh, they're, they're committing without even being called out and paying a dime in overtime, which they do pay thousands of dollars in overtime. Just for the training alone, these four agencies are combined. They're contributing $26,000 to uh, what is a, a team that operates uh, on a level of 78% of the time in the city. They don't have to do that. Um, they do that and they don't ask for much in return. Um, what they ask for obviously is if they have an incident uh, that requires a cert response that we make ourselves available under the guise of the terrorism task force. And I believe it's an eight county response area. I agree with you in terms of uh, larger issues. One of the things that we're gonna present in our capital budget for the second year in a row is uh, the idea of getting a Bearcat tactical vehicle which costs more than $350,000. And I had the idea of going to the other municipalities and counties and asking for support with regard to a project like that, rather than having to foot the entire bill here in Lycoming County and or the city. So I agree with the participation of more entities. We could even get um, from a regional perspective in the future, we could get participation from a manpower standpoint from uh, officers from other counties as well. But it is what it is right now. It's a 30 year old team that started and was made up originally of only city officers. We have uh, seen the participation over the last 20 years of anywhere between one and now up to five officers. And so we're right on that verge where we're almost half and half uh, at the operational level. And I don't have any problem with discussing it with the county um, it's just that we have always run it here in the city and, and so this is how we do it. Um, but I'm, I'm willing to explore changes at any time. You know, I might get myself in hot water here, chief. Uh, but you know, it's the way I'm looking at it is we're in the, in the middle of two huge cultural moments right now. One is our budget related to COVID-19. The other is, um, the fear of putting more money into something related to increased militarization of police at this point. And, and we're, these are problems that we need to be very careful about how we resolve going forward because we need to be like on, on pins and needles when we approach our budget, but also the way we approach the, the community relations between the police. And that's not, I know the CERT team does great work. It's, that's not the, the issue. I just wanna make sure we're, we're being very cautious in how we proceed on both of those fronts. I'm an old community policeman, and I uh, I love the community as as much as anyone who's ever worn a badge. I can assure you, while this team is under my command, it will be used in a judicious way. Um, the existence of the team saves lives, not just officers' lives, but um, people in the community. And so, uh, if it'll keep us from all having to put black suits and dresses on and go to funerals, I'm for it. Uh, whether someone uses the term militarization or not, if it saves lives, that's the most important thing. Mr. Slaughter. Thank you, Chief. And, and just to add to Councilman Banks, um, and it, it, as we're discussing training, um, and I've spoken with Chief Hagan about this as well, um, would include de-escalation training, um, uh, diversity, uh, implicit bias training, things of that nature as well. So we've been discussing all those items as well, Chief Hag and, I and others. Uh, that is true. Um, we just uh, 
found an opportunity for implicit bias training for department wide through Caliber Press, the same uh, very well nationally recognized and respected training agency that provides street survival training. Um, they have implicit bias training. Our training uh, supervisor, Sergeant Ottaviano, is, is in communication with them trying to figure out how we can set that training up for all the members of our police department before the end of the year. And we're trying to figure out what other mandatory training we can schedule along with it sometime in the fall. Um, we also plan on doing diversity training and uh, other diversity training and also de-escalation training. However, we, we have not been able to schedule de-escalation training. We had it scheduled earlier in the year and now that opportunity is gone because of COVID. So we're, uh, we're battling many issues all at the same time, as you're well aware, and, and we're doing our best. But we have not just CERT training issues going on, but those that uh, require attention at the department level for every officer. And we're monitoring all of that very closely. Now, Chief, I appreciate that. I know it's more you wanted to get into in this conversation, but I appreciate your response. And Randy, if I could interject yes, too. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I would agree that we find ourselves in a very specific and hopefully um, never again to be repeated cultural moment on many fronts. <laughs> and, um, but, uh, um, but, uh, but I, you know, I think um, we have, we, we, I, I am, I'm, Delighted to see the administration and the police administration um, specifically undertaking um, as many efforts as we can to uh, to 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 bring an awareness of, of diversity and et cetera, et cetera, to our to our department. And I think that's an excellent thing, um, and and hopefully will help us to avoid some of the the, the truly um, terrible things that have happened elsewhere in the country. Um, but uh, but our primary decision here and now is, is more related to uh, the pandemic and the city's increasingly tight budget. And, um, and that, I think, uh, um, there, there are all sorts of things that predominate in my concerns right now, but, but, um, but I, I feel as though we do need to, um, we need to focus on trying to keep our budget trim. We need to, uh, we need to focus on trying to regionalize because that will in the end save us money. Um, however, with, um, if the city takes on all the fiscal responsibility before we, before we make that regionalization a true reality, it's likely to stay that way. And that is to say that, that if, um, right, that, that, it, that if we move first by saying, okay, great, we want, we want you here so much that we're going to pay for you to be here, <laughs> then, then the benefits of regionalization um, are, are going to evaporate before our eyes and we're not going to see any, any kind of fiscal relief from, from the regionalization efforts. Um, Chief, if I can ask, who the, the um, you referenced the biweekly trainings that all the CERT members attend, um, which is an, an excellent thing to have in place. Um, where is the budget for that and, and, and who conducts those trainings? Our CERT leadership uh, conducts them with its members. Um, okay, so we do each, that in house. We do. Each each agency pays their own officers' wages for that uh, training. There are twenty, typically twenty six or so trainings uh, scheduled per year, and then uh, the last couple of years, a week long training in New Mexico, sponsored and paid for entirely by the federal government. But uh, those trainings are paid for and, and supervised by our agency. They include entry training, firearms training, uh, less lethal training, all of the different skills required uh, by a tactical team. Uh, they do a training plan uh, before the, uh, the uh, calendar year and we go over it with the leadership to approve it. And then they do everything they can to make sure and execute that. Uh, obviously this year has been a uh, an exception to the normal course, but uh, that's that's how we've operated for years. Got it. And, and I'm assuming so that means that we, um, we we obviously pay our command staff and, and trainers to host that training, and we also um, I would assume 
to take care of all the paperwork associated with that week in New Mexico and getting reimbursed by the federal government for the, for the CERT team to go out there? Actually, the week in New Mexico is paid up front by them. We don't, we don't, they pay meals, uh, flight, hotel, everything, the training. Oh. We don't, we don't have any, any costs there. That's great. So we, so we just deal with the paperwork for it, basically, the, the kind of application process, participate in all of that for all the CERT members, but we don't, we don't at any point lay out money that we're getting reimbursed for. Um, so it does sound to me as though we already, as the, as the municipality most heavily invested in the, in the CERT program, as though we already do quite a bit of, 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 of legwork. Um, and I think that's excellent. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm proud of our department and I'm proud of us having taken the lead on this for 30 years. <laughs> um, that's, uh, that's, that's fantastic. And it's, and it's good that we're keeping it going and, it, and it's good that it fills such a huge um, function in, in the area. Remind me again, you said that they, um, you named a handful of things in the finance committee that the CERT team had responded to. I think one of them you said was the president's visit. Um, yes, the primary uses of the team are uh, obviously the most regular use are high risk warrant services, search warrants, but it, it, they do executive protection they uh, respond in quick reaction forces to uh, critical incidents, including riots and uh, downed officers and, and down like shot down civilians. They can respond to rescue operations in some cases. They handle barricaded gunmen, hostage situations, um, uh, incidents involving armed individuals out in the open uh, that would require sniper operations. They, they can respond to a, a whole host of very, very uh, difficult, dangerous situations that we, we uh, otherwise would be sending uh, regular patrol officers into from our agency and mutual aid that might not be uh, as well equipped to handle. Excellent, thank you. Um, that's, that's everything I have. Thanks, Randy. You're welcome, good job. Uh, any other comments? So there was talk of amending. Is that still something anybody wants to do? I'm fine with either. I, I, I would note on the amendment while I'm happy with the second motion, Adam, if you want to make one that, um, that uh, having, having in my 10 years on council put um, a time limit in a resolution in the past, I find that it seldom acts as the trigger one expects it to. <laughs> um, but uh, but I, would, I would request, regardless of how we move forward with this, if we move forward with these agreements as, as written, um, that the finance department please uh, create some, a, a line item in the police budget that, that lines out our expenditures for special training for, for certain officers. Because um, I feel like that will also help serve as a trigger to us to, to recognize what those expenditures are and what are we mm -hmm. Yeah, Liz, um, I, I would agree. And, you know, with, with your experience on council, if, if adding something like that into this has been ineffective in the past, let's just pass it as it is one way or another. Um, and Chief, I would request um, it, on top of the line item, as, as Councilwoman Mealy had said, which I agree with, um, I would request continue forward as we had discussed in committee and here tonight in communication with the county. And uh, I would ask you to bring us back to us, just even if it's an update and an opportunity for us to discuss this at this time next year. Um, please do. Yes, sir. And I, I, I also thought it might be appropriate during budget time each year. Um, Certainly. We, you know, we would be talking about this as part of our overall training budget what part of that is represented by CERT, whether it's separate or not. Um, I would be prepared at that time as well. Certainly, and thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. And I think th there was another piece of information you're working on that, to present to council. So uh, we'd be grateful to receive that as well whenever you get that compiled. Yes, sir, and then it'll be there forever. Every time you ask. 
There you go. <laughs> That'll be our big uh it wasn't kept in an organized way, so it'll yeah. I apologize right. I didn't have it ready tonight, but it'll take a few more days. That's okay. It just that get that'll be the baseline and we can uh, be up to date on that. Um, are there any other comments on this? Uh, we'll take the vote on this particular item and then I'm just going to ask for a motion in a second and we'll take the vote right away because they're all the same. So there's no sense on asking for any further discussion unless something occurs to somebody, just jump right in. Um, okay. Uh, Mrs. Frank, will you take uh, the role on the motion for item six, please? For five. Mr. Yoder. Yes. Mr. Polizzi. Yes. Mrs. Katz. Yes. Mr. Banks. No. Ms. Mealy. No. Mr. Allison. Yes. Uh, motion passes four to two. Thank you, Mrs. Frank. Uh, we'll move to item six. Um, it's the same resolution, only for Tidat and Valley Regional Police Force. Uh, is there a motion and a second? So um, second. There's a motion and a second. Uh, Mrs. Frank, on the motion, please. Mr. Yoder. Yes. Mr. Polizzi. Yes. Mrs. Katz. Yes. Mr. Banks. No. Ms. Mealy. No. Mr. Allison. Yes. Motion passes 4 2. Item 7, same resolution, this one with the Lycoming County District Attorney's Office. Motion in a second. So move. Second. Thank you. Mrs. Frank, please. Mr. Yoder. Yes. Mr. Polizzi. Yes. Mrs. Katz. Yes. Mr. Banks. No. Ms. Mealy. No. Mr. Allison. Yes. Motion passes 4-2. Thank you, Mrs. Frank. And item eight, same resolution with the Lycoming County Sheriff's Office. Motion and second, please. So move. Second. Thank you. Mrs. Frank, please. Mr. Yoder. Yes. Mr. Polizzi. Yes. Mrs. Cat. Yes. Mr. Bank. No. Ms. Mealy. No. Mr. Allison. Yes. And that motion passes 42. Thank you, Mrs. Frank. Uh, we'll move on to item nine, uh, authorizing resolution, authorizing execution of a management contract agreement. Uh, would you read that in short form, please, Mrs. Frank? Thank you, Chief Hagan, by the way. Thank resolution, you. Resolution authorizing the execution of a management plan and management contract agreement between the City of Williamsport and Endless Mountain Transportation Authority. Thank you, Mrs. Frank. Is there a motion and a second on this one? No move. Second. And there it goes. Motion and a second. Um, Mr. Winder. There you are. Good evening. Um, this resolution is a resolution to execute a management agreement as well as a management contract with Endless Mountain Transportation to fulfill the administrative and key management needs of Endless Mountain Transportation. Um, in 2012, River Valley Transit started managing endless mountain transportation with a team um, they were approached by PennDOT in 2011. Um, AMTA was in disarray at that time. Um, so River Valley Transit has been managing endless mountains since 2012. Um, so this resolution is coming before you with the management plan to continue the relationship for another year. Um, in the management plan, it does identify um, that EMTA or Best Transit will be invoiced $91,000 quarterly for uh, in the amount of 
$22,750 each quarter. And also for support staff at the amount of $434,474.49. And that will be on a quarterly basis as well at an amount of $108,618.62 per quarter. <clears throat> we also do some shared ride service for Best Transit, um, which is a premium service provided under the MATP. And that reimbursement will be at $8 per mile with a 75 mile cap. Um, this was reviewed by Finance Committee on Tuesday, passed on with a positive recommendation pending some um, minor changes to the resolution and the agreement itself. Um, we did add the third paragraph as requested on the resolution. Um, and we did make sure that the agreement identifies just a one year term. Um, I believe Mrs. Frank did email that out to everybody on council. Mm -hmm. um, the other question that came up would was exactly how the um, uh, financials would be paid out to the members of the management team that previously received a check directly from EMTA. Um, EMTA's board requested that the money would come through the city and be dispersed to those uh, members of the team that received them rather than a check directly from EMTA. Um, so the way that it would actually work would be the RBT management employees covered under the agreement will be paid in a stipend for their work performed for EMTA. This stipend is not part of the base pay for any of these employees. The monies will show up as other income on the city pay stubs. There will be no pension contribution by either the employee or the city. EMTA will be invoiced on a quarterly basis for the stipend and related employer taxes. Over the course of the last two pay periods, a time study has been conducted, which tracks the employee hours for both RVT and EMTA. This time study will be conducted on a quarterly basis, which could result in changes to stipends based on work performed. Um, the employees also um, pending approval by council for this, will be signing a document that identifies they understand that if the relationship or any changes with EMTA would definitely change that stipend. Um, I will definitely entertain any questions you may have. And I have Todd right here with me who has been working with EMTA since 2012. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Winder. Um, Ms. Mealy, we agree in finance. They come before finance and reported to the Sawadi Council with a positive recommendation. Um, I think uh, Ms. Katz was the, had, had raised the, the pension issue, and, um, and I'm thankful that Mr. Winder managed to resolve it uh, so speedily. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, the, the only other question I think we've had, Adam, and I'm assuming that we've moved on this as well, was changing the, the, um, the agreement to reflect the fact that this is a one year agreement currently. Um, and not, excuse me, I know that we didn't do that. Never mind, I reviewed that. Um, but but uh, to reflect that this is a one-year agreement and no longer a five-year agreement, as it said in our management agreement, um, in, the one, in the one that we reviewed on Tuesday. Yes. Um, yep. This is a, uh, um, has thus far been a, a positive relationship for the city and uh, apparently for EMTA as well. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and is, is helping uh, River Valley Transit, Williamsport um, Bureau of Transportation, in its goal to regionalize. Um, I think that, that really that's the, um, uh, the, 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 the partnerships between um, Clinton County and the Endless Mountains Transportation Authority have been very positive examples of regionalization for the city and, and for our transit arm. Um, and I know that we're still sort of looking at what to do with the uh, with our transit arm as a whole, but, um, but, but certainly I think we've provided benefit to the other counties that we service and, um, and we in turn have recognized the benefit uh, um, in the city from a fiscal perspective as well. So I'm glad to see this relationship. 
Thank you, Ms. Mealy. Um, other members of finance? M Mrs. Katz. Yes. Uh, oh, there you are, Adam. Um, one of the questions I asked you at the committee meeting was how many people were receiving checks from, from EMTA? And you told me five. Five, right? per, yes. Now, when you figure out the cost of the checks that are coming from EMTA, we're talking $250,000. So five people are going to split $250. No. Explain to the, me then. The 91,000. You said that's quarterly. Five, it's the quarterly is $22,750 to equal out the 91,000 per year. We're getting $500,000 from EMTA a year, right? Correct. Well, it's actually, a, 530, roughly 533,000. And from what I understand with this is that half of this is for RVT expenses and then the other half is supposed to be for payroll. Is that okay. right? The 91,000 is the five employees that work at RVT and are part of the management team for EMTA. Then the 434,474.49, that is the call center. It's, um, we have one employee that works in the Mansfield side of EMTA on a regular basis. So that's to cover his portion. Um, it covers 30% of another employee's salary here um, because that, that's how much time he spends doing um, regulation checks, different things of that nature. Um, there's a reimbursement. So the 434,000 is a reimbursement. The 91,000 is what EMTA was paying the management team separately. Okay, here's where we have a problem. We asked at least two months ago, if not longer, to give us the breakdown. You are working for RVT, you are working for also Streets and Parks, and now you're also working for EMTA. Now, we have to know who's doing what with whom and how these salaries are combined. And if you're not doing, if you're not working with the city at this point and mostly with RVT and EMTA, then we should not be paying your salary from the city. It should be coming out of RVT. That's the purpose of the um, time study. Um, PennDOT's requesting the same thing and that's why we're doing the time study right now but we haven't gotten that information yet. You know, it, we've been waiting for how long? And at this point, we're also concerned of who's, and this is for you, Mayor, who's who's doing what to whom at this point. And, and we've asked for the breakdown of these salaries that we shouldn't be responsible for the city budget of paying these people. And we're talking Adam, we're talking Chris Cooley that are working. And I think Joel has been spending a lot of time over there. So therefore, why, you know, why isn't we are, why aren't we given that breakdown yet? You're the breakdown from who's doing a, a, what, when you're saying? Right. Council? We need to know, you know, if we're not, if the city is, you know, not getting the services from Adam from streets and parks and Chris Cooley as our, our IT person, which this is where we were told they were hired. Now they are over RVT. We have to know why, where are things going with salaries there? Right, and well, Chris and Adam are still doing, Chris is still doing IT work as well. And Adam's still doing uh, streets and parks, um, as he said, and we're doing the time study. And as I, um, the article today, it was asked the same question and I you know Councilman uh, Yoder asked the question uh, so we posted, we posted a while ago for Stephanie Young's position, um, and due to COVID, we were not able to interview in person. We started that process. Um, we're actually probably going to have to reactivate it and repost that, um, due to one reason or another, some of the candidates, uh, could not, uh, fulfill the residency requirement. Um, same with, or, um, so we're looking to also the finance director was another question you all had. Uh, and so I'm going to, I spoke to okay. Councilman Allison earlier today, 
Uh, the previous administration did not have a line item for finance director, so I will need to work with Joe Pavlock and the city council to insert that line item with a salary um, as we look to start to fill the finance director as of uh, July 1st, we will start to um, actively search to fill that position as well as uh, RVT permanently start to uh, fulfill that. And so the time study, uh, Councilwoman Katz, will allow us to determine, um, you know, what percentage or what part of the time. Um, but to answer your question, uh, as far as that's related to, um, Mr. Winder is still doing uh, streets and parks work as well as uh, filling in with RBT and interim and Mr. Cooley is still doing IT work uh, for the city and not just RBT obviously um, for the city. Uh, however, moving forward, we do need to and we will uh, permanently fill those roles and we need to uh, and we will start to do that here as of July 1st now that we are sort of uh, getting on the other side of COVID into a, a little bit of, of normalcy here as we start to gradually reopen. So I, well, I, I, agree, I, I agree with you, Councilwoman, that uh, we need to, um, you know, permanently fill those so that we don't have uh, Mr. Winder, Mr. Cooley, um, you know, in those roles indefinitely. <laughs> I was happy to see in the paper that you're taking the residency ordinance seriously as far as hiring the people in these positions. Um, hopefully you're going to compare apples to apples and the person that lives in the city gets the job. Well, it, um, you and so, I worked very hard on this, mm -hmm. if you recall. And I, yeah, and they have to, uh, it's, the, it's the ordinance now, they, it's a requirement that they have to uh, reside in the city or move into the city uh, per their em employment uh, start date. Um, and also, um, we were, there was a question, and I don't know, Mr. White, if, if and I, I don't have the answer to this. Um, for example, uh, Ms. Young's position was posted prior to the ordinance, uh, city council's ordinance going into effect um, as it pertains to the residency requirement. If an individual applied prior to the ordinance going into effect, does the residency requirement, and I'm fine if it does, I was just, I don't know the answer to that question. Does the residency requirement impact that person. Typically, um, I would, I'd say that the um, that the residency would apply until the person is hired, because up until the point when someone is still an applicant, mm -hmm. they still have not created a legal relationship with the city, and until they actually are hired, uh, I mean that that relationship has not been solidified. So the ordinance that would apply. Um, to determine whether or not they're eligible for hiring would probably be the one that exists at the time that the hiring decision has to be made. Um, so if you have somebody who is not a resident who applied um, when, the new, when the old ordinance is in, was in effect, um, I would say that the, the, uh, you'd have to look at the new ordinance to figure out whether or not they would still be eligible to accept or be um, uh, taken employment. Okay, that was my assumption. I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. You're welcome. So yeah, Councilwoman Katz, I, I'm in agreement with you there as far as the, the residency and, and obviously Mr. White and just clarified can, that they would- And if forward. we can get a breakdown as far as where we stand salary wise, uh, I think we'd all appreciate it because I think we've all been asking that question, you know, and plus I think it's kind of, um, you know, construction, street construction has opened up. Uh, RVT is always busy, so we know where that is. And especially with the virus, they were extra busy trying to keep everything organized and how to, you know, social distancing. So therefore, you have two major departments that are, you know, a go. And you know, one person trying to do all that, I think, is asking a lot. I really do. And uh, I think you should make a decision as soon as possible where you're going to go with this. And as I said, yep, as I said, we will begin that process very soon. We've already started it with Ms. Young and we're gonna start the rest of it, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, in the very near future. And okay, I thank you. I, do, I, I would say that, I, you know, I know I'm a little biased, but Mr. Winder has done a great job um, over these, and Mr. Cooley uh, filling in over these six months and kind of getting us, you know, through the pandemic and through the changes. And 
I, I appreciate the hard work that they've done. And it's still a lot of work for one person. I'll defer to other council people now. I have a question of comrades. I think uh, Adam has his hand up. Yeah, just to follow up on some of your questions, Councilwoman Cass. Um, I'm glad to hear that we're going to start the process for a number of positions, specifically RVT, July 1. That's great news. Um, I assume it's going to mimic the process that we've looked at and leveraged to fill uh, Stephanie Young's position. Um, we'll post it, um, go through a, um, an open, uh, transparent process with a number of people involved in the interview process, I, I trust. Gotcha. Um, and uh, the only slight difference would be for finance director because we have to we have a little bit of work to do on the back yeah. end of that first. Yeah. No, uh, understood. Um, understood completely. Um, do you do you have any rough timeline of of when you would like to have somebody in place for RVT? You know, it's it's difficult to put a timeline in place. You know, we'll post, we'll get the applications back, we'll go through the process of all of them, not just RBT, finance yeah. director, Stephanie's position. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's not going to be, you know, a year from now, uh, but I can't say it's going to be two weeks from now. So, yeah. you know, whatever, you know, I'll work with HR <clears throat> and get the, get it, you know, everything posted, get them back, get the applications back, and then the process that we do. Yeah. Um, if, if you had mentioned this, I missed it. So any apologies for uh, redundancy? Do you have a timeline on the time study? Uh, um, Mr. Winder, yeah. The, the first one finishes out tomorrow. And then we do another one in two weeks. And a follow up to that. Uh, I guess we can discuss when we bring that back to you, we can discuss it. Yeah, it would, it would be good to see all of that. Um, I don't know if it makes sense to pause this for two weeks to see that and just understand how the, um, you know, the, the management fees and what have you impact any of our um, salary requirements for um, RVT, for any of the parties involved. It would be good to understand the, the ripple effect these management fees will have um, on our budget, not only with RVT, but for the city. So I don't know what other council members think of that, but that might be something worth um, pausing for two weeks to understand that better. As far as in, uh, when you say ripple effects. Yeah. So for example, I mean, if you, we have a $91,000 management fee that the individuals in this are going to make, um, it's going to be split up between the, that group. I'm assuming. Um, I mean, that's an average of $13,000 per person in this. So I would assume that we are leveraging this to offset um, some salaries or salary requirements or um, this does not affect, affect their city salary at all. Right. I'll use um, our CFO here for an example. Most days she spends 14 hours a day here. So she's actually doing majority of EMTA work after her normal seven hour shift for River Valley Transit. Um, during audits, she will spend countless hours here, weekends, etc. cetera. Um, the employees, the, the five employees that are in the management agreement, they're salaried employees through the city of Williamsport at 35 hours, and they're putting in closer to 60 hours a week. That was the reason behind why the money was paid to them through EMTA. But it is cleaner with the money, and this is what EMTA wanted, with the money coming into the city and then uh, going out to them that way. I believe, Mr. Winder, that was one of the reasons EMTA wanted yeah. it done that way. It's just cleaner on the financial side of things. Right. And um, I apologize for not bringing this up earlier, but EMTA's board actually voted on this yesterday and approved it under the understanding that um, adjustments may be made based on the time study. So, um, you know, if it seems as if we have, for example, the employee that's spending 30% of his time on EMTA and we're getting a reimbursement, if it turns out he's spending 50% of his time, they're okay with us saying, hey, we have to make this adjustment and showing them the reason why. 
Gotcha. No, just ninety one thousand dollars is a lot of money, and and you know, with you look at thirteen thousand dollars, that's that's not a full time wage. I understand that, but that's a lot of money. Um, and given you know, we have a number of people working extra. Um, just not sure if uh, it made. I don't know. I don't know the history of the past, but I'm just not sure if it made sense to have somebody else um, do some of this, um, whether it's a part time or a full time person. So we're not stretching people too thin, but. You mean possibly adding additional uh, city employees to up there? On the RVT side, potentially. Um, I, again, I, I don't know if that's been explored. Um, if it has in the past and it wasn't executed, I'm sure there was probably a reason. It's just an observation, so. I think uh, it, it, at some point um, <clears throat> we had, uh, and we still do have, I think, in the, uh, in the queue that we're going to get a um, DCED audit of everything, correct, Mayor Slaughter? Yeah, we're working uh, through that right now, actually. That was um, throughout the COVID, that office was, it was kind of paused. And um, I'm working with the local government services rep now. <clears throat> She's kind of uh, keeping me up to speed with what's happening there. Um, so. That was one area that some monies may be cut from. So she's just keeping me abreast as to how we move forward. So her suggestion is um, to submit the application with the hopes that uh, it's not cut. Uh, but we are looking at getting a DCD uh, financial study to develop a strategic financial strategic plan. Yes. Yeah. It would address some of these staffing issues. But in any case, it sounds like that might be um a little bit farther on um, yeah i'm hopeful that it was it was delayed uh, just like everything else and so i'm hopeful that um the state is able to keep that um program um intact okay miss mealy i see your hand um i just wanted to say that that adam for the for the record i do agree with you i don't object to moving on this agreement in this meeting but um it seems like a um Speaking as someone who's given to working uh, 60 and 70 hours a week a lot, uh, there's there's a point at which um, one does lose some efficiency, perhaps. And I and I think uh, I think that they, that it probably would be wise for us to look at the global staffing needs of RBT as it becomes a regional entity and how to best this how to best distribute staff hours. Um, when we're asking that much time of people, I, I think we, um, not only is that perhaps not fair to our employees, but it's also um, perhaps not getting the best, the best value for our partners in, in, the, in the project if, if someone's putting that much, um, that much time in per week. It, it, that's, that's, it, it's, it's hard on your head. And um, so I, I think, while it may not be something that we're, that we're in a position to do anything about right now, it's definitely something that we should be considering. Um, you know, can we, uh, as, as we move further into this relationship with MSHA, can we, can we normalize whatever our fiscal relationship with them is in such a way that, that, that some of this funding becomes salary funding with pension and benefits for someone instead of being merely um, and, and other uh, income source that, uh, that, that complicates the, the way in which they serve in the number of hours that they're, that they're giving to us. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but, but I don't know that we'll resolve that this evening or, or two weeks from now, but I, I think it's a valid point and we, and we need to be looking at it. Mr. Starr? And it, along those same lines too, many of these employees have been doing it since the inception of this management agreement. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I think, um, you know, I think it would be prudent to review and speak with them, which hence the time study um, so that we don't wear them then. Um, I, I had one question for Mr. Winder. Who's going to do the time study? Um, each individual actually has to fill it out and we have to submit it to PennDOT. Oh, so it's a self-regulated study. Yes. Yep. Is there anybody overseeing or verifying yes we actually um nicole farr who's the cfo of the finance department 
she's overseeing everybody in the finance departments and she submits them to me. Um, we have the fleet manager for the um, maintenance department. He'll oversee his staff, then submit them to me, so on and so forth. Okay. So yeah. we're trying to hold checks and balances. Right. Okay. I, I didn't, I just wondered if it was internal or if there was an external entity doing it. Um, and so the EMTA uh, transference or stipends or uh, checks is, so that's the totality of that kind of transaction, the five people that we have? Yes, the 91,000 is the taxes as well as the stipend. All right. Okay. Uh, Mayor Slaughter? I want oh, one other piece of that. It is, as you're looking at the skills though, that these five individuals have provided over the last number of years, uh, it, it may be difficult, I'm just thinking too, and this was brought to my attention, um, to find one individual to do that. You know, we have to keep that in mind as well. Just something to think about. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Between Todd Wright and Nicole Farr and others that have worked on this since the beginning, they have gained obviously a significant amount of knowledge and skill set as related to EMTA and uh, all of the various, you know, uh, process that go into that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, so where do we stand, Council? Uh, ready to vote tonight? I heard somebody, uh, Mr. Yoder, you mentioned delaying. Is that even, is that even possible, Mr. Winder? Does this need to be passed in a certain time frame? It should be voted on tonight. The issue was trying to negotiate with EMTO and exactly how they wanted everything. And due to COVID-19, trying to do everything over the phone and um, their board members are made up of uh, county commissioners, nine mm -hmm. county commissioners. So trying to pin them down to hold the full negotiation was a little difficult. I'll bet. Uh, I think they would be delighted if it was voted on tonight, but of course it's council's decision. Okay. I mean, technically, we're operating in time of the Yeah, I mean, I, I personally would be okay holding off for two weeks. Again, look, I, I, I get that, um, given the circumstances, what have you, that um, this was, um, <laughs> the, the, it was a challenge to get this negotiated with a lot of parties, what have you, but I think there's some lingering questions that I think a number of us would like some answers on, so. Um, I, I don't see, I don't know that that hinders the execution of the agreement. Um, I, I don't think it would be a bad idea to wait two weeks to table this and wait two weeks until we can um, see some more details on the time study, what have you, to truly understand um, how this will affect um, everything else going on with our um, team members in the city and RVT, mm -hmm. um, as well as um, allow the mayor to um, start the process of um, filling a couple open um, positions, specifically the head of RVT. So it would give him some time to um, add clarity to that process. So, um, uh, Mr. Polivi had his hand up before we go any farther with that. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Allison. Yeah, I I was pretty much going to say exactly what uh, what Adam had already said that. Uh, Given the amount of questions that are still out there regarding people here. Uh, moving forward with this, uh, I, I agree with Councilman Yoder that I don't think it would hurt to hold off for uh, a couple of weeks until we get the time study. We're able to see this a lot better. Um, Mr. Winder, I can uh, understand exactly what you're saying, though. Um, trying to get that many people around in a, in a room to all agree on something would the uh, only something I could think of is comparable to trying to herd some cats. Um, so I could assume it's quite difficult, but I just want to err on the side of caution with this one um, in the best interest with our constituents and making sure that we're going forward with this as, as the best way I think we should. Um, yeah. The only thing I will have to do is reach out to PennDOT tomorrow and let them know that um, at this point, 
that's tabled for two weeks and make sure they're okay with us holding as best transits management team come July 1st without an agreement. Yeah. I appreciate that, Mr. Yeah. Wendell. Yeah. 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 That's what, what? I was going to say, what happens if PennDOT says that they are not, then what happens? Then I'm it just goes out for, it goes out for a, um, basically a bid process for a new management team. Okay. Um, so I think potentially the implication here then is that we could be, uh, forced to hold a special meeting if PennDOT is not okay with us waiting two weeks on this item? Correct. Sounds like that's a possibility. Got it. Like I said, the, the biggest challenge was nine county commissioners from all different counties getting them all together at one time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm just I'm just clarifying what what obligation we might be under if PennDOT does not agree to extend this for a couple of weeks that we might all have to come back next Monday or something and have a meeting that, that accepts this agreement if that's what we're going to do. Yeah, Adam, I would assume we you will find that out pretty quickly. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So if, if that if that instance happens, um, just uh, I mean, let us know. I don't know why we couldn't do that. But aside from that, I don't think it's a bad idea. Um, and I would make such a motion to table for until our next council meeting. They potentially can make us liable. Is that an official motion? Yep. I second that. Okay. A motion in a second. Um, is there anything more you had to say, Mr. Winder? No, I'll get answers tomorrow. Okay. Um, uh, just, you know, July 1st becomes the the big date, um, as long as right. PennDOT can verify that we're okay. Okay. I want to make sure if we had to meet Monday, there would be a quorum before we take the vote. Um, how many could make a special meeting on Monday? I can be there. It depends on the time. Okay. I'm planning to have two babies on Monday. Pardon me? I'm planning to have two babies on Monday. That's right. Yes. Um, one, two. Uh, I'll make sure I'm there. Okay. Randy, excuse me. I don't know if I'll have time to advertise it for Monday. Practically speaking, Tuesday would also be valid. How about Tuesday? If I know tomorrow, I can put it in. Do, do we still have four for Tuesday? Tuesday works better um, than Monday. I'm fine. Adam Yoder. Sorry, I didn't realize it was due to yes, I can make Tuesday as well. Okay. No. I can do it in the evening. Uh, and John, John may be available as well. Okay. Um, we have a motion and a second to table. Um, Mrs. Frank on the motion to table, please. Mr. Yoder. Yes. Mr. Polizzi. Yes. Mrs. Cat. Yes. Mr. Bank. No. Ms. Mealy. No. Mr. Allison. No. Uh oh. Is that tie? Okay. Um, three to three, the motion to table fails. So um, we'll be voting on the resolution then. Mrs. Frank on the resolution. Mr. Yoder. No. Mr. Polizzi. No. Mrs. Katz. No. 
Mr. Banks. Yes. Ms. Mealy. Ms. Mealy. You're sorry, Dennis. Yes. Mr. Allison. Um, yes, I didn't hear Mrs. Katz. She's no. said no. Okay, the okay, we have the conundrum here. We have a tie. Does that mean the mayor passed the vote or does that mean it fails? No, so so that means the motion fails. So your options are you move on because the motion failed, or um, someone who uh, voted uh, someone who voted no can reintroduce it as a new motion um, if you want to have further discussion for purposes of amending it. Um, but you know if there if there's if there's if you're at an impasse you're at an impasse and you, know, you move on. And you can always bring it up at another meeting if you want to put it on a agenda for a special meeting on Tuesday or something like that. It doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean it was rejected. It just means it was not approved. So we're asking what you're telling me is we're in effectively the same position as though we had tabled it? Yeah, essentially only, you know, it's not on the table. It's just it doesn't exist as an agenda item anymore. So for a special meeting, held next week, it would just have to be put up as a new agenda item um, and it would have to be advertised. Like Ms. Frank said, she would need to get it on uh, for a meeting or she has a, needs to advertise at least 24 hours in advance of a special meeting. Okay. And likewise, if the administration wants to put it back on in two weeks time, they can simply put it back on as a new agenda item. Accurate? Yes. Yeah, they could put it on as a new agenda item, assuming that something has changed re realistically, you know, if we're, if we're working with parliamentary procedure, you wouldn't put the same, the same exact agreement on um, twice after a motion failed. Um, but for instance, you have this council member not here tonight. So that's Mr. Mackey could, could in fact motion to have that represented if he wanted to in old business. But if we're, if we're, you know, practically speaking, I think it, it sounds like since there was some interest in perhaps revisiting it next week, um, you know, you could do that or, or you could wait two weeks. Uh, we may not have that option. So, um, okay, we'll wait to hear from uh, Mr. Winder tomorrow. Um, and, and also, I mean, you consider that if you do get it um, up for uh, a new agenda item next week, because we need to have it or an agreement in some form, Mr. Mackey then would... Um, you know, could break the tie. So he would be, if, if you had a full, if you had a full body together of council, you've got a 4-3 and you're not in a position to have a tie. Well, most likely we're, we're having six. So that, that's with Mr. Mackey. But um, I think we can uh, work around that because uh, a lot depends on Mr. Winder's uh, conversation tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, tomorrow's going to be an interesting day. Not that they all haven't been lately. Um, okay, we'll move on to item 10, certificates of appropriateness from HARB. Um, item uh, two under 10 is uh, Matt Summerson, 520, 522 West Third Street. There's a list of things that are going to be worked on or repaired. Is there a motion in the second? On uh, oh, item four is 800 Park Place LLC, uh, 800 West Fourth Street, and the list of those repairs. Uh, is there a motion on second on item 10? So moved. Second. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion, question? Hearing none on the motion, this is Frank, please. Mr. Yoda. Yes. Mr. Polizzi. Yes. Mrs. Katz. Yes. Mr. Banks. Yes. Ms. Mealy.
Mr. Allison. Yes, Jenna, sorry. Yes, uh, motion passes 6-0. Thank you, Mrs. Frank. Um, we're moving to upcoming or um, accepting for filing, I'm sorry, item 11. Uh, Finance Committee minutes of May 12th, 2020 and HARP minutes of June 6th, 2020. Is there a motion and a second? I move. Second. There's a motion and a second. Uh, questions, comments? Hearing none, Mrs. Frank, please. Mr. Yo. Yes. Mr. Pelizzi. Yes. Mrs. Katz. Yes. Mr. Banks. Yes. Ms. Mealy. Yes. Mr. Allen. Yes, motion passes 6 0. Item 12 is announcements. Next regularly scheduled city council meeting will be held on Thursday, June 9th, 2020, at 6 30 p.m. Uh, and we will be having um, July 9th. I'm sorry. Did I say June? Um, anyhow, it will be remote. Um, Upcoming meetings, Monday, June 29th at noon, um, the Recreation Commission. Friday, July 3rd, 11 a.m. ERC. Uh, will there be, I doubt there'll be a meeting unless is there business for ERC in the pipeline for the two Not months? Not the best of my recollection. Um, okay. I am trying to remember if we were gonna bring back the uh, the recovery plan discussions in two weeks time, but it seems to me that we didn't have a two week timeline. Am I correct, Mr. Yoder? Um, yeah, we, we we did and we didn't. Um, we did mention the idea of um, having that as a recurring item just to make sure that um, the chamber specifically has um, the city's support. And uh, if there's anything needed that there's a, a venue for collaboration. So I, I believe we kind of do. Yeah, so it's it, there's there's the potential that we will have one, Randy. I think. Okay. Right. We'll leave it there. Then um, we'll, we'll let Janice know. Um, Friday, July third at noon p.m. Uh, noon housing needs. Tuesday, July seventh, eleven thirty a.m. Public safety. One p.m. Finance. Two thirty p.m. Public works. Wednesday, July eighth, three thirty p.m. O and E pension. And Thursday, July 9th is our council meeting. Um, are there any uh, comments from council tonight? Mr. Yoder. Um, yeah, um, there was a lot of um, comments, questions about the whole fireworks thing that transpired this week. Uh, Mayor Slaughter, uh, any insight um, you can provide as far as just um, clarification on um, the, what had happened with your um, with, with the the moving and um, if you can just verify that there's no city funds that come out of that um, that'd be great a lot of a lot of constituents were asking about that this week so there are no city tax dollars to that um, that is paid for by backyard broadcasting and their sponsors gotcha. um, and as far as what transpired we thought we had a location that we could shoot them off from here um, as I believe everyone is probably aware now, uh, it, there's an active bald eagle's nest. The half mile radius uh, went on to that property. Um, so I needed to contact the state and federal governments to make sure that we were okay since we were just outside of that zone um, of that half mile radius. I contacted US Fish and Wildlife Service, I was waiting to hear back from them um, and the decision was made uh, by the backyard broadcasting to move them uh, to the fairgrounds. Um, I had suggested other locations in the event that the US Fish and Wildlife Service was not comfortable being that close uh, to an active bald eagle's nest. However, I had not had, I'd not, did not receive official word yet. I was waiting for written confirmation from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service saying that had we shot off the fireworks display from that location, they were uh, comfortable that it would in no way affect or impact the active bald eagle's nest. And there's no, yeah, I answered that, no city tax dollars uh, go into that. 
And um, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mayor Slaughter. Does that answer your question, Ms. Yoda? Yeah, I appreciate the clarification for the uh, for the record and for the public. Thank you. Mrs. Katz. You're muted. Bonnie, you're muted. There you Mayor are. Slaughter, I would like to clarify something with the rumors that are going around that the reason the fireworks are not being displayed on the bridge as usual is because the permit wasn't filed. Is that true or is not true? Mr. Winder, when normally what we do is we do close the bridge that allows us to do the line painting uh, and all of that. Mr. Winder contacted PennDOT and they were told that permits go through central office and that they were not uh, grant approving any of those permits at this time. Is that just for this is that just for this year or? I, I can't speak for PennDOT. I would imagine it's probably given the uh, extremely unusual circumstances of this year, obviously, because we've been granted it. Why do you think that was a problem this year instead of, you know, uh, no other yeah. problems for 25 years? That would be a question for PennDOT. I cannot answer that question. Okie dokie. Ms. Mealy. Um, I was briefly hope hopeful that Mr. Yoder was going to raise the other fireworks issue that I found to be more of a problem <laughs> here in the city right We've now. We've all found it to be a problem. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so I might as well bring it up. Um, we passed an ordinance, oh, it wasn't that long ago, what, maybe four years ago now, about um, setting a... Uh, a daily time frame as well as a span of time in which people could set off fireworks within within city limits, and uh, I, I believe me, I completely understand that everybody is antsy and wants to get out and do something, and attempting to blow themselves up is clearly high on the list. Um, but uh, all of that said, are we are we doing anything to try to limit the? I mean, it's it sounds like there's a fireworks display in town every night around around eight thirty right now. Um, and I, I don't know, um, I don't know what our recourse is, but I've, I've been getting a lot of complaints about it. So I figured I might as well bring it up. What do you, what do you say? As have I, and you know, they can, you know, our police, the difficulty is obviously by the time we get there, uh, they've scattered. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if we are aware, I, I believe Chief Hagan answered this as well during committee, we can come and remind them and you know give them a warning remind them of the ordinance and then you know if it's clearly it's every night uh, you know even it's all over and i've been hearing the same um and it has to be you know we have to be able to um it's almost as if you know you have to be there when they're shooting them off you know if if you know if you can you know wherever it is you know we once we respond, we have to be able to, you know, whoever shot them off, we have to know who did it and that we can confirm that they did it. Uh, they need to be there when we get there. That's that's the difficulty in this. Uh, but I agree, we do have an ordinance and, and it's, it's being enforced, but it's, you know, it's just, it's difficult. It's very, very difficult uh, when they're all over the place every single night. And I'm not, that's not an excuse by any means, but if you know who it is or where it is, contact us, let us know, you know, even uh, Mr. Girardi as well. Um, I know that it was presented to him um, and we can go to that property, that location, that person or people and let them know uh, that there is an ordinance that needs, you need to follow it and you'll get a warning. But then beyond that, you'll start to get, you know, fines and enforcement of the ordinance. Got it. Um, so what we're asking for then is information from citizens in Williamsport who are being bothered by the continual fireworks noise um, as to where it's happening and, and, and right. not so much an, a narking on your neighbor thing as a preserving the uh, public. Well, right yeah, technically that, I mean, I don't know, reporting and reporting a, a violation of an ordinance basically, you know, is right. what it is, what it would be. Uh, someone has to report it in order for us you know i you know if i look outside and i see a firework 
you know, a couple houses down, I can go and take a look if I need to figure out, you know, if I'm the one that's going to call it in where it was. And then of course has to be, you know, evidence and all that type of deal. Yeah. So it's, if it's a, I mean, I, I it's as frustrating to me as everyone else. I, I mean, I, I clearly relate to everyone's concerns and I've been getting a, a lot of the calls as well. Uh, and, you know, trying to be proactive and, you know, get to the spots where they're going off and usually they have dispersed by the time people arrive, uh, which is frustrating. I fully understand that. Uh, and however, if it's a, if it's ongoing, uh, you know, for for example, if it's the same house every single night and you live next door, that makes it a little bit easier for us, obviously, to enforce that. Because we can, we can anticipate that uh, possibly, you know, if you say my neighbor for the last week has been setting him off at 930 every single night, uh, you know, you could give us a heads up on that and we can, you know, kind of, you know, go and let them know. Got it. Um, is there a number that people should be calling? Derek, they could call, I mean, they could call 911, obviously, but there's a non-emergency number. Uh, hang on a second. I don't know if I have that off the top. Um, uh, uh, three, it's uh, 570-327-7560. That's our watch commander uh, number, and that's the desk. So, yeah, yeah. It doesn't seem like it justifies an emergency response, but right, right, right. Could it be yeah, no, that would be the watch commander, and you could just let them know it's a non-emergency. But if uh, if you could send someone to remind them of the ordinance and give them a warning, and then you know we can enforce the the uh, fines thereafter. That'd be good. Like I said, it's not unexpected given that there are a lot of people who've been cooped up for a long time, but it's been intense for sure. I think we need to remember that, that there's a time and a place for fireworks and it's it's not the end of June, it's the beginning of July. So um, it's the I believe the weekend before the fourth through the weekend after. I, I think mm -hmm. it's this Sunday and runs through next Sunday or yeah. something. Like yeah, that. something like that. Yeah. It might be wise to get that in the paper at some point too, or on Facebook. And, and on yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I had a conversation with uh, Mr. White today um, because uh, this obviously the increased uh, strength of the fireworks and uh, the increased access to those kinds of fireworks um, are from the state law that was passed couple of years ago. Um, I think that's adding uh, a big layer to the problem. Uh, it, what, it wasn't near as um, loud uh, over the past several years. Um, so I, I asked Mr. White, he's going to research the state law to see what latitude we have, what, what it does or doesn't prevent us from doing. Um, my feeling is uh, if we cannot enforce the ordinance we have on the books, then with our uh, law enforcement, then we're going to have to take other measures as counsel. I believe severely restricting the time that they can be set off is a start, um, possible start, or uh, possibly eliminating it within city limits. If, People are going to be irresponsible. Um, it bothers pets. It severely affects uh, individual, individuals with PTSD. Um, it, it just disrupt. It's a disruptive. It's not just a noise nuisance now. It's, um, it's disruptive. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's reached a, a level that I think is untenable if it goes like this in the future. Obviously, this year, there's little we can do, but I think we need to revisit that ordinance itself. Um, it, it has to be more than a piece of paper, and maybe we can work something out. I mean, 
Um, there's a, a neighbor of mine that heard the loud booms and found a group of kids down at Cochran School setting them off. Turns out they were from Loyal Sock. Um, there's all kinds of different um, uh, different permutations of why and where it's happening and who's doing it. Um, but uh, someone told me, I haven't seen it, but Old Light Coming restricts it just to the day of the fourth. Um, we live in a city that's densely populated. Houses are close together. Uh, there's a 150 foot limit. Uh, from, you have to be 150 feet from a, a, a structure. And if you're on public or private land that's not your own, you have to have permission to be there doing it. So I, I think there's a lot of potential for enforcement. We just need to figure out uh, a way to um, to get people out there to to do that. So, you know, I think maybe through public safety, we can work on that as well, with the police department. And there's gotta be some creative ways to, uh, <clears throat> to track these down. Um, I've noticed in our neighborhood, um, they go on for a period of time where I think if someone was driving around could find them because they're not moving. So um, that's just my take, but uh, I know the public is had it up to here, so uh, we need to respond in a, a meaningful way. My opinion, anyhow. Um, other comments or questions from council or anything? Ms. Mealy. Uh Just to follow up on um, other loud noises in the in the city, <laughs> uh, and I don't know. Derek, I don't, I, uh, I don't need an answer to this today, and I don't know that there is an answer, an easy answer to this. But, uh, but the 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 other issue that at least those of us who live in um, larger thoroughfares in Williamsport often notice is um, exceptionally loud vehicles that come out this time of year, um, whether it's uh, whether it's pickup trucks with straight mufflers or um, you know or or, or um, Harley's with straight mufflers. Uh, things that generate a lot of noise on the street and, and really um, kind of lower quality of life in the, um, especially when there's, for instance, possibly also speeding. Uh, I don't know if there's a recourse for um, for dealing with that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's breaking the city's decibel requirement. And, and I don't know if we can think of some way that we, that, that um, citizens of Williamsport can help the police enforce both speeding and or noise violations on city streets that are that are disrupting quality of life as well. Is this, do you have a specific area that you know that this is happening? Or I would say that it's, that it's certainly throughout downtown. My guess would be that it's also an issue, say, up on Grampian or any of the, the streets where you can kind of get a good straightaway going. Um, okay, our engineer is looking into a few places now, um, particularly related to speed um, and, and kind of yeah. Um, very early on in the year, starting to, you know, look at areas where uh, we might need, you know, look at a stop sign or, you know, some of that nature. So we can yeah. add, I can make him aware of other locations as well. Well, well, I have, have, have him reach out to me then because I might have some. Okay. Yep. I can, I can speak for um, some business owners downtown without their seating who mentioned. Sure. Um, road noise there is going past their places in the evening, but I can't speak for uh, other areas in the city as much, but I think if we put some dealers out, we probably would get some feedback. Sure. Um, I'll have them uh, contact you. Yeah. To that effect, Liz, um, there is a state law um, about something like 95 decibels within 30 feet. Mm -hmm. That is an enforceable law. Uh, you know, we'd have to get decimeters and, you know, that. <laughs> I just found out that those exist on every eye watch now. <laughs> but you know there there are enforceable laws that may not be on our books yeah. uh, but we'd have to have the means to do that yeah and, and, you I, know, and i did also contact the city engineer about traffic calming so uh, please loop me in that conversation if you have it with him awesome we'll do sure. yeah i think it, it's something that that um that a number of us are kind of passionate about who, who live and work in like the downtown area just to um 
there's, there's a lot of high speed traffic moving between third and fourth street, especially because of the one way streets. And, uh, and it makes you nervous, not only from a danger perspective, but just from a quality of life perspective. Um, I mean, these are uh, by and large residential streets or retail streets and, and, and we need to try and make certain that they're, that they're livable and, and, and walkable. So anyway, um, small point. Thanks, Randy. You're welcome, thank you. Anything else from council members tonight? Mr. Yeager. Uh, yeah, just just one more. Um, again, I had a number of people asking me over the past couple of weeks. We've seen articles about um, different levels of government reopening, specifically the county. I know that they're pretty close to, if not back to full operations in person. Um, it it, it um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure where the city is at. So I just thought I would ask, um, since people were asking, where are we at as far as our the city's level of reopening city hall and a number of our um, other services to the public. Yeah, uh, the tax office is open nine to two. Those doors are open on the west side of the building. Um, and codes is open. Codes has been open. Codes is open. Um, everything else right now is by appointment only. Uh, I have uh, Joe Allen. HR is working on a plan logistically right now. The difficulty for us is we don't have a front office slash reception area. Um, so when city hall is wide open, it's wide open. And so, uh, people could just walk around anywhere. And as you all are aware, the comfort levels of folks are all over the place at the moment. Um, and so for folks to just be able to aimlessly walk around or walk into someone's office, um, is concerning for some folks. So we're working on the logistics of that right now. Um, but taxes can be paid, uh, on the, you know, nine to two, like I said, codes is open and the rest of us, um, is, you know, are there and if you need, if it's an appointment or you need something, you know, all the numbers are listed on the door um, and, you know, you can you can meet with us, uh, you know, throughout the day, whether that's finance or, you know, myself or whomever. Cool, thank you. Um, do you have a, do you have a timeline on um, when you foresee or when you think um, that transition will be made from appointment only to, or, or not really? It's difficult. I mean, we have to figure out, we're going to have to figure out the logistics of it. Uh, so it would, it would, we would be open most likely right now if we had a reception area. And I know we've had this discussion even when I was on council prior uh, to what that might look like. Um, and so, you know, that's the, diff that's the difficulty of it all right now. Uh, and that's kind of what folks are coming to me with is uh, when we're open, uh, if I have a random, um, you know, a citizen come in and just walk into my office and I don't know who that person is and there, there's a lot of variables. And so we have to work through that. Uh, and so, you know, it, it most likely will come to a point where um, we just need to open and, you know, we probably will not have the logistics of that nailed down because I don't believe, you know, obviously we're not going to have a reception area. And so most likely it's going to just be where we, we will need to remind the public and just put, uh, put X's or lines or whatever on the floor uh, and just have them respect uh, personal space. No, thank you for that. Like I said, a number of people were asking me here over the past couple of weeks as other bodies have um, have started the transition to that. So appreciate the clarification. Mm -hmm. Mr. Pulizzi. Thank you. Um, actually, Mayor Slaughter answered one of my questions already regarding the tax office. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Thank you very there's much. Still the, there's still the drop box outside as well. So if folks want to just drop it off and they don't want to come in, if they're, again, people's comfort levels are all over. I've had people saying, are you going to keep the drop box there? We're not comfortable coming inside. And it's, yes. Uh, and then you have people, you know, all over. So, yes. So anyways, yes, Mr. Pelizzi, your councilman Pelizzi, it's uh, <laughs> nine to two. Thank you. Are Thank you going to pay your tax bill? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it when I miss it. <laughs> Uh, we can start this discussion with council um, about when we're going to go back. Um, my thinking right now, and we can all, we don't have to do it tonight, uh, is at least the next meeting in July, stay remote, um, but begin to uh, find out what, what it's going to look like when we go back. And that'll uh, kind of uh, indicate a timeline for us. Um, you know, 
So that, that would be our next meeting in two weeks would be uh, remote. But in the meantime, uh, like Humming County staying pretty steady, uh, things are looking good here. So, you know, if it stays that way, I think we can really make a plan, you know, uh, see how everybody feels, uh, your comfort levels and, uh, and the administration as well, you know, because we're all going to be, be meeting together. So uh, we got to think about that particular room that we're in and what that would look like and how how it could accommodate us um, or not accommodate us uh, is going to, to tell the tale there. Is everybody comfortable with that approach? Okay, uh, any other comments from council tonight? Um, Mr. Flizzy. Just one last comment and then I'm done. I uh, just wanted to wish everybody a happy and safe 4th of July, uh, wherever they do decide to partake. And if they do decide to get involved with their own fireworks, <laughs> please be safe, respectful, uh, and abide by the ordinances and the law and uh, yeah, be safe, not just for yourselves, but for everybody else around you. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Mr. Polizzi. Anything from the administration tonight? Mr. Girardi. Uh, yes, um, just wanted to make council aware of it. And I know the mayor is probably already aware of it that um, we do collect brush and Adam's done a great job of going around the city and collecting brush, but we're at this point, we're no longer correct, um, collecting brush out in the street right away. It's going to be the responsibility of the residents to remove it and bring it up to the mulch pile. Uh, my guys, my officers will be out this week, putting door tags on, knocking on doors and giving a verbal warning to have it removed. So I just want to make sure if you get a call or something, we're no longer collecting it. Next time we collect anything, I believe Adam will be down towards leaf pickup towards the fall, if I'm correct. Great. Yep, I just want to make sure everybody was aware of that. And along those same lines, we did extend it a little bit this year due to COVID. So right. yeah. some people may be a little bit confused, but it's, as Mr. Girardi said, it's over. Uh, so we're, we're, it's not, some people think it's year round collection, I believe. Sure. Um, so that's another ordinance on the book that, it, you know, makes our streets you know, not look nice. And then folks call and say, there's yard debris out there. And and then the other side of that coin too, is if we keep picking it up, they're going to keep putting it out. And that's not, absolutely. That's not the case. So thank you, Mr. Girardi for bringing that up. Um, okay. Administration. Uh, that brings us to public comments. Mr. White. Okay, um, we have uh, a number of comments. I'm going to go ahead and just get started with them from the oldest to the newest. Okay. Okay, the first comment is from Joanne Hawk of, uh, addressed to the president of city council. Hello, this is Joanne Hawk. I'm a driver for RVT. It has been a couple of weeks since I first asked about our RVT contract and nothing to date has been settled. I'm not surprised by this as I am disappointed and disgusted with the mayor and council for not taking this matter seriously. Unlike you all who work safely from home, the RVT drivers have been driving since the beginning of the so-called pandemic without any extra compensation of any kind and continue dealing with the public on a daily basis. Why? Let me say, uh, let me just say, I think you should all voluntarily ride the buses during this pandemic time to see what we deal with day in and day out. I would like to see a meeting of all RVT drivers and the mayor and his council to be set up. This is our livelihood. And yet here we are seven months later and nothing has changed because I feel you all don't care enough to settle this matter. The next comment is the same comment that was emailed from a number of people. They are Tima Cummings, Misty Dion, Jody Bainey, Karen Koch, uh, 
uh, Shaylin Sluzalis and Jay Harner. All of those individuals emailed the same comment and I'll read it verbatim. Council President Allison, in 1990, 30 years ago, the Americans with Disabilities Act became law. Williamsport has been obligated for decades now to ensure that City Hall is accessible to individuals with mobility disabilities and to the blind. A 1973 law obligated Williamsport to ensure access even earlier. For decades, the city has disregarded its obligation to provide people with disabilities access to a safe, unencumbered route of travel into our City Hall and throughout the building. As you know, the city council chamber itself is not accessible. We have tried to work this out amicably for years. Time is up. We have decided to take the city's violations of the law before the federal court. The lawsuit will be filed within days by our Philadelphia attorneys, David Furliger and Thomas H. Earl, experienced civil rights and ADA lawyers. The plaintiffs are the Center for Independent Living of North Central Pennsylvania and the North Central Pennsylvania ADAPT, advocacy organizations which, among other things, work on behalf of individuals with disabilities regarding mobility and access, together with individuals who have personally and repeatedly been denied the access to which they are entitled. Williamsport has intentionally discriminated against plaintiffs and acted with deliberate indifference to their rights. The city has made deliberate choices. The failures here are not the result of negligence or bureaucratic in inaction. We are asking the federal court to award money damages to be paid by city and also to issue orders that the city remedy the violations of the law. Here's an example of one of the many points the suit will cover. We are all familiar with ramps which facilitate entrance to buildings. For City Hall's main entrance, there is no ramp, although the city has in hand approved architectural designs and received bids to do the work. City Hall construction costs is less than one half of 1%, that is 0.476% of the city's current five-year capital budget. The city has deliberately chosen to maintain violations of the federal accessibility laws from top to bottom of city hall. The consequences of the city's non-compliance affect thousands of other citizens of Williamsport, as well as visitors to the city. 17% of the civilian non-institutionalized population of Williamsport are disabled. Of the 4,667 total number of people with disabilities in the city, 3,362 of the city's populations have ambul ambulatory difficulty. It is time to open the doors to the seat of our city government. And that uh, the next comment is from Brittany Sluzales. It says, Dear Council President, my name is Brittany Sluzales from North Central PA ADAPT, and I am a disabled resident of Williamsport. The Americans with Disabilities Act is only one year younger than me. I've lived the long majority of my life as a Williamsport resident, and I've never had equal access to Williamsport City Hall, among many other buildings and venues in our city and surrounding areas. Why do we as disabled people have to go so far to demand the same access of those of you who can walk up those big stairs to get in the same building? All I want all we want is an equally accessible life. Instead, you treat me like a prisoner and make me enter your building through a segregated entrance that is designed for police officers and alleged criminals. It's been 30 years for you to fix this for residents like me who want to contribute to public policy in our local government. We've talked about how to do this for more than, we've talked about how to do this for the past three years. Enough words, more action. I wish you would care about people like me and take my input as seriously as you would any other resident. And then the final comment is from Jody Bainey, President Council Allison. Why when residents of Williamsport need to call the police to report a crime, non-emergency, does it take 10 minutes, numerous recordings, and finally redirected to call a 433 number to talk to a live person? And that concludes the public comment. Thank you, Mr. Allison. Thank you, Mr. Lloyd. Appreciate it. Mr. Slaughter. I did have one other thing I, I just thought about. As far as the summer lunch program, I just wanted to remind folks that Tuesdays and Thursdays from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Currently, it's at Newberry, Brandon Park, and East End Shaw Park. Newberry 
is not being very well attended at all. There's a possibility we will explore looking at moving that to Los Park. Mm -hmm. um, just it's been a very, very low turnout in Newberry. Um, so there, I know there are a number of kids that live around the Lowe's Park area as well. So we're just trying to, you know, we don't want the lunch program, the lunches to go, you know, we want to get them out to the community. So if we can help spread that word and let folks know um, that we do have that available. Great. Thank you, Mayor Sly. Um, I think that's it for the regular meeting tonight. Again, we have our executive session following. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you, Council. Thank Aye. you, Administration.